Side 3, Considering Kate, by Nora Roberts. Continuing on page 128. Let me do this, he murmured. He nudged the dress from her shoulders, watched it slide down her body to the floor. She was so slender, so finely built, a man could forget those tensile muscles beneath all that silky, gold-dust skin. Her curves were subtle, a sleek female elegance that fascinated and demanded his touch. Her breath snagged in her throat when he skimmed his fingertips along the curve of her breast, along the lace edging of her bra, then under it as if memorizing shape and texture. The hard pad of callus brushed her nipple and turned her knees to jelly. Intrigued by her tremble, he shifted his gaze back to her face, watched her as his hands roamed down her torso, along her hips, stroked up her thighs. I think about your legs a lot, he told her, and flirted his fingertips along the top of her stocking. Ballerina legs, you know. Just don't pay any attention to my feet. Dancers have incredibly unattractive feet. Strong, he corrected. Strong's really sexy to me. Maybe you can show me some of the things you can do later, like you did for Rod that day. I nearly swallowed my tongue. Though she laughed, her hands were far from steady when she drew the shirt over his head, let her own fingers explore that tough wall of muscle. Sure, I can do even more interesting things. They both quivered when he lifted her and laid her on the bed. If it had been a dance, she'd have called it a waltz. Slow circling steps in a match rhythm. The kiss was long and deep, warming the body from the inside out. She sighed into it, into him, and her arms encircled. This, she thought, dreaming. This was something, someone, she wanted to hold. Love was a quiet miracle that bloomed in her like a rose, and loving she would give. Then his mouth was on the curve of her breast, rubbing along that edge of lace, arousing, enticing, and bringing the first licks of heat toward the warmth. She moaned as his tongue slid over that swell of flesh, teasing the point, then tugging on it through the thin barrier of lace. Her hips arched and her fingers dug into his. Waltz became tango, slow and hotly sexual. His mind was full of her, the scents, the textures, the sounds. All of it, all of her, seemed to whirl inside his brain, making him dizzy and drunk. She was carved clean as a statue, the long hot length of her beautifully erotic. He wanted to touch, to taste everything, all of her. Absorbed with her, he did as he pleased while she rose and rolled and shuddered with him. And when he took her up the first time, when that lovely body tensed and her breath came and went on a sob, the thrill of it coursed through him like a drug. More and still more, a little greedier, a little faster, he tugged away those barriers of lace. Now he wanted only flesh, hot and wet and soft. She matched him, step for step, rising to him, opening herself. Her mouth found his as they rolled over the quilt, diving heedlessly into the kiss while her hands pleased them both. As desperation increased, she tugged open the button of his jeans, dragged them impatiently down his hips. Oh, I love your body. I love what you do to mine. Hurry, hurry, I want... Her system erupted, her mind blanked. Even as she went limp, his fingers continued to stroke her. I want to do more. He used his mouth, sliding down her breast, torso, belly. She began to move again, and then to writhe while pleasure and need pounded together inside her. Her eyes were blind, her body quaking when he rose over her. With his heart hammering and his mind crowded with her, he filled her with one long stroke. With a low sound of pleasure, he held himself there, sustaining the moment, letting the thrill of it batter his system. Her hips lifted, then fell away to draw him with her. Beat for beat they moved together, eyes locked, breath tangled and ragged. Her hands groped for his, gripped. The slide of flesh to flesh, slow and silky, the pulse of heart to heart, solid and real. And when the wave rose up to swamp them both, he lowered his mouth to hers and completed the joining. She lay limp as melted wax, eyes closed, lips curved, and enjoyed the sensation of Brody collapsed on top of her. His heart continued to knock, hard, fast raps, that told her his system had been as delightfully assaulted as hers. It had been a wonderful way to discover they were compatible in bed. 
It was so fascinating to be in love, really in love, not like the couple of times she'd been enchanted with the idea of love. This was so unexpected, so intense. She drew a long, satisfied breath and told herself she'd give the matter, and the consequences of it, a great deal of careful thought later. For the moment, she was going to enjoy it. And him. No one had ever made her feel quite like this. No one had ever opened her up to so many feelings. Fate, she thought. He was hers. She'd known in some secret place inside her the first instant she'd seen him. And she was going to make certain he understood when the time was right that she was his. She'd found him, she thought, utterly content as she stroked his back. And she was keeping him. For a man who claims to be out of practice, you certainly held your own. He was trying to decide if he had any brain cells left, and if so, when they would begin to work again. He managed a grunt. That response seemed to amuse her as she laughed and locked her arms around him. He managed to find the energy to turn his head, found his face buried in her hair, and decided that was a fine place to be. Want me to move? No. Good. Just give me an elbow if I start to snore. Oh, Connell, just kidding. He lifted his head, levered some of his weight off her, and onto his elbows. The green of his eyes was blurry with satisfaction. You're incredible to look at. So are you. She lifted a hand to play with his hair. Not really blonde, she thought idly. Not really brown, but a wonderful mix of tones and textures. Like the man himself. You know, I wanted you here from the first time I saw you. She lifted her head just enough to bite lightly at his jaw. Total lust at first sight. That's not usual for me. I had pretty much the same reaction. You jump-started parts of my system that had been on idle for a long time. Ticked me off. I know, she grinned. I kind of liked it, the way you'd get all scowly and turned on at the same time. Very sexy, very challenging. Well, you got me where you wanted. He lowered his head to give her a quick nipping kiss. Thanks. Oh, my pleasure. And since I'm here... He moved his lips to the side of her throat, nuzzled. Her laughing response turned to a gasp as she felt him harden inside her, begin to move inside her. Hope you don't mind. I've got a lot of lost time to make up for. No. Her body woke and pulsed. Be my guest. It wasn't easy, Brody discovered, to have a relationship, at least the physical part of it, with a woman when you had a child. Not that he'd change anything, but it took considerable ingenuity to juggle the demands of the man and the demands of the father. He was grateful that Kate seemed to enjoy Jack and didn't appear to resent spending time with him, or the time Brody devoted to him. The fact was, if she hadn't accepted the boundaries and responsibilities that went along with Jack, there wouldn't have been a relationship, physical or otherwise, to explore for long. He guessed he was having an affair. That was a first. He'd never considered his relationship with Connie as an affair. Kids didn't have affairs at 21. They had romances. He had to remind himself not to romanticize his situation with Kate. They liked each other. They wanted each other. They enjoyed each other. Neither of them had indicated anything more than warm feelings and lust. And that was for the best, he decided. He was, first and last, a father. He didn't imagine most young women, career women with dozens of options ahead of them, generally chose to settle down with a man and his six-year-old son. In any case, he wasn't looking for anything more than what there was. If he had been, he'd have to start tackling the problem of changes, adjustments, and compromises for all three of them. That was bound to be messy. Certainly a grown man was entitled to a simple affair with a like-minded woman without crowding it in with plans for a future. Everybody was happy this way. He stepped back, lowering his nail gun to examine the trim he'd just finished on Kate's office. It was a rich, elegant look, he decided. Classy. And it suited the woman. He wondered where she was, what she was doing, and if they could manage to steal an hour alone before he had to go home and tackle the dinosaur poster Jack had to do for a school project. Sex, carpentry, and first grade, he thought, as he moved over to start trimming the window. A man never knew what kind of mix was going to stir up his life. He'll love this. Kate examined the fierce, snapping jaws of the plastic predator. Dinosaurs are a no-fail choice. Annie rearranged toys that didn't need rearranging and slid her gaze toward Kate. That Jack O'Connell's as cute as they come. 
Mm. His father's not shabby either. No, they both ring the bell on the cute scale. And yes, we're still seeing each other. I didn't say a word. Annie folded her lips. I never pry. No, you just poke. She tucked the dinosaur under her arm. That's what I love about you. Now I'm going to go back and say hi to Mama before I go. Want me to wrap that beast up for you? No. Wrapped, it's a gift. Unwrapped, I can sneak it in as a research tool for his school project. You always were a smart one, Katie. Smart enough, Katie thought, to know what she wanted and how to get it. It had been two weeks since she'd made love with Brody for the first time. Since then, they'd had one other evening alone and a handful of hours here and there. She wanted a lot more than that. They'd taken Jack to the movies, shared a few meals as a trio, and had engaged in the mother of all snowball battles the previous Saturday when a solid foot of snow had fallen. She wanted a lot more than that as far as Jack was concerned, too. She knocked on her mother's office door, poked her head in. Natasha was at her desk, her hair scooped up, and the phone at her ear. She curved her finger in a come-ahead gesture. Yes, thank you. I'll expect delivery next week. She tapped a few keys at her computer, hung up, and sighed. Perfect timing, she told Kate. I need a cup of tea and a conversation that doesn't involve dolls. Happy to oblige. I'll even make the tea. Kate set the dinosaur on her mother's desk before turning to the teapot. Natasha eyed the toy, then her daughter. For Jack? Hmm. He has a school project. I figured this might earn him some extra points and be fun. He's a delightful little boy. Yes, I think so. Kate poured the hot water into cups. Brody's done a wonderful job with him, though he had terrific material to work with. Yes, I agree. Still, it's never easy to raise a child alone. I don't intend for him to finish the job alone. Kate set her mother's cup on the desk, sat down with her own. I'm in love with Brody, Mama, and I'm going to marry him. Oh, Kate. Tears flooded Natasha's eyes even as she leaped up to embrace her daughter. This is wonderful. I'm so happy for you, for all of us. My baby's getting married. She crouched down to kiss both of Kate's cheeks. You'll be the most beautiful bride. Have you set the date? We'll have so much planning to do. Wait until we tell your father. Wait, wait, wait. Laughing, Kate set her tea aside to grab Natasha's hand. We haven't set a date because I haven't convinced him to ask me yet. But I'm certain a man like Brody, he's really a traditional guy under it all, wants to do the asking. All I have to do is give him a nudge to the next stage so he'll ask. Then we can get on with it. As worry strangled the excitement, Natasha sat back on her heels. Katie, Brody isn't a project that has stages. I didn't mean it exactly like that. But still, Mama, relationships have stages, don't they? And people in them work through those stages. Darling. Natasha straightened, sat on the corner of her desk. I've always applauded your logic, your practicality, and your sheer determination to earn a goal. But love, marriage, family, these things don't always run on logic. In fact, they rarely do. Mama, I love him, Katie said simply, and tears swam into her mother's eyes again. Yes, I know you do. I've seen it. And believe me, if you want him, I want him for you, but... I want to be Jack's mother. Now Kate's voice thickened. I didn't know I'd want that so much. At first he was just a delightful little boy, as you said. I enjoyed him, but I enjoy children. Mama, I'm falling in love with him. I'm just falling head over heels for that little boy. Natasha picked up the dinosaur, smiled as she turned it in her hands. I know what it is to fall in love with a child who didn't come from you. One who walks into your life already formed and makes such a difference in your life. I don't question that you would love him as your own, Katie. Then why are you worried? Because you're my baby, Natasha said as she set the toy aside. I don't want you to be hurt. You're ready to open your heart and your life. But that doesn't mean Brody is. He cares for me. She was sure of it. She couldn't be mistaken. But the worry niggled at her. He's just cautious. He's a good man, and I have no doubt he cares for and about you. But, Katie, you don't say he loves you. I don't know if he does. Frustrated, Kate got to her feet. Or if he loves me, if he knows it himself. That's why I'm trying to be patient. I'm trying to be practical. But, Mama, I ache. Baby. Murmuring, Natasha drew Kate into her arms, stroked her hair. Love isn't tidy. It won't be, not even for you. I can be patient. For a little while, she added on a watery laugh. I'm going to make it work. She closed her eyes tight. 
I can make it work. It was hard not to go over to the job site. She'd had to stop herself a half a dozen times from strolling over and seeing the progress, and seeing Brody. She made it easier on herself by spending part of the afternoon making and receiving calls in response to the ad she'd taken for her school. The Kimball School of Dance would open in April, and she already had six potential students. There was an interview scheduled for the following week for an article in the local paper. That, she was sure, would generate more interest, more calls, more students. A few more weeks, she thought, as she pulled up behind Brody's truck in his driveway, and a new phase of her professional life would begin. She didn't intend for the next phase of her personal life to lag far behind. He came to the door in his bare feet and smelling of crayons. The fact that she could find that both sexy and endearing in a grown man showed her just how far gone she was already. Hi, sorry to drop by unannounced, but I have something for Jack. No, that's okay. He wiped at the magic marker, staining his fingertips. We're just in the middle. In the kitchen, he said, gesturing. But it isn't pretty. The process of school projects rarely is. It surprised him that she'd remembered the project. Had he talked about it too much? Brody wondered as he followed her back to the kitchen. He was pretty sure he'd only mentioned it, maybe moaned a little, in passing. She stepped into the kitchen ahead of him, surveyed the scene. Jack was kneeling on a chair at the kitchen table, hunkered over a sheet of poster board and busily applying his crayon to the inside of an outline that resembled a large pig, as seen by Salvador Dali. Several picture books on dinosaurs were open on the table, along with illustrations probably printed off the computer. There was a scatter of plastic and rubber toys as well, and a forest of crayons, markers, pencils. A pair of work boots and a pair of child's sneakers were kicked into a corner. A large pitcher half full of some violently red liquid sat on the counter. As Jack's mouth was liberally stained the same color, Kate assumed it was a beverage and not paint. As she stepped in, her shoe stuck to the floor, then released with a little sucking sound. We just had a little accident with Kool-Aid. Brody explained when she glanced down. I guess I missed a couple spots on the cleanup. Hi, Kate. Jack looked up and bounced. I'm making dinosaurs, so I see. And what kind is this? It's a Stagiosaurus. See? Here he is in the book. Me and Dad, we don't draw very good. But you color really well, she said, admiring the bright green head on his current drawing. You gotta stay inside the lines. That's why we drew them really thick. Very sensible. She rested her chin on the top of his head and studied the poster. She saw the light pencil marks where Brody had drawn straight lines for the lettering of the header. Jack had titled his piece, A Parade of Dinosaurs. She found it apt as his drawings marched over the poster in a long squiggly dance. You're doing such a good job, I don't think you're going to need the tool I brought along for you. Is it a hammer? Afraid not. She reached into her bag, pulled it out. It's a deadly predator. It's a T-Rex! Look, Dad, they ate everybody. Very scary. Brody agreed and laid a hand on his son's shoulder. Can I take it into school? Because, look, its arms and legs move and everything. His mouth goes chomp, can I? I think it'd be a good visual aid to your project, don't you, Dad? And there's this little booklet here that talks about how he lived and when and how he ate everybody. Couldn't hurt. Jack, aren't you going to thank Kate? Thanks, Kate. Jack marched the dinosaur across the poster. Thanks a lot. He's really good. You're welcome a lot. How about a kiss? He grinned and covered his face with his hands. Nuh-uh. Okay, I'll just kiss your dad. She turned her head before Brody could react and closed her mouth firmly over his. He avoided kissing her, touching her, when Jack was around. That, Kate decided, deliberately sliding her arms around Brody's waist, would have to change. Jack made gagging noises behind his hands but he was watching carefully, and there was a funny fluttering in his stomach. A woman's got to take her kisses where she finds them, Kate stated, easing back while Brody stood flustered. Now my work is done. I have to go. Ah, oh, can't you stay? You can help draw the dinosaurs. We're going to have sloppy burgers for dinner. As delightful as that is, I can't. I have an appointment in town. Which was true. But she thought the ambush... The drop-by, she corrected, would be more effective if she kept it brief and casual. Maybe this weekend, if you're not busy, we can go to the movies again. All right. I'll see you tomorrow, Brody. No, no, she said when he turned. I know the way out. Get back to your dinosaurs. 
thanks for coming by, he said, and said nothing else, not even when he heard her close the front door. Dad? Hmm. Do you like kissing Kate? Yeah. I mean... Okay, Brody thought, here we go. Because Jack was watching him carefully, he sat. It's kind of hard to explain. But when you get older... Most guys like kissing girls. Just the pretty ones? No. Well, no. But girls you like. And we like Kate, right? Sure we do. Brody breathed a sigh of relief that the discussion hadn't deepened into some stickier area of sex education. Not yet, he thought. Not quite yet. Dad? Yeah. Are you going to marry Kate? Am I... His shock was no less than if Jack had suddenly kicked his chair up from under him. Geez, Jack, where did that come from? Because you like her and you like kissing her and you don't have a wife. Rod's mom and dad, sometimes they kiss each other in the kitchen, too. Not everybody... People kiss without getting married. Oh, man. Marriage is a really important thing. You should know somebody really well and understand them and like them. You know Kate and you like her. Brody distinctly felt a single line of sweat dribble down his spine. Sure I do. Yeah. But I know a lot of people, Jax. Feeling trapped, Brody pushed away from the table and got down two clean glasses. I don't marry them. You need to love someone to marry them. Don't you love Kate? He opened his mouth, closed it again. Funny, he thought, how much tougher it was to lie to your son than it was to lie to yourself. The simplest answer was that he didn't know. He wasn't sure what was building inside him when it came to Kate Kimball. It's complicated, Jack. How come? Questions about sex, Brody decided, would have been easier after all. He set the glasses down, came back to sit. I loved your mother. You know that, right? Uh-huh. She was pretty, too. And you took care of each other and me until she had to go to heaven. I wish she didn't have to go. I know. Me, too. The thing is, Jack, after she had to go, it was really good for me to just concentrate on loving you. That worked really well for me. And we've done all right, haven't we? Yeah, we're a team. You bet we are. Brody held out his hand so Jack could give him a high five. Now let's see what this team can do with dinosaurs. Okay. Jack picked up his crayon. His eyes darted up to his father's face once. He liked that they were a team. But he liked to pretend that maybe Kate was part of the team, too. Chapter 8 Brody set the first base cabinet in place, checked his level. He could hear, if he paid attention, the whirl of the drill from downstairs as one of his crew finished up the punch-out work on the main level. Up here there was the whoosh and thunk of nail guns and the whirl of saws as other men worked in the bedroom of Kate's apartment. It was going to be a hell of a nice space, Brody thought, the perfect apartment for a single or a couple without children. It was a little too tight to offer a family a comfortable fit, he thought, as he crouched to adjust his level. Then he just stayed there, staring into space. Are you going to marry her? Why the devil had Jack put that idea into the air? Made everything sticky. He wasn't thinking about marriage, couldn't afford to think about it. He had a kid to consider, and his business was just getting off the ground. He had a rambling, drafty old house that was barely half-finished. It simply wasn't the time to start thinking of adding someone else to the mix by getting married. He'd jumped into that situation once before. He didn't regret it, not a minute of it. But he had to admit the timing had been lousy, the situation difficult for everyone involved. What was the point of heading back in that sort of direction when his life was still so much in flux? Just asking for trouble, he decided. Besides, Kate wouldn't be thinking about marriage, would she? Of course not. She'd barely settled back into town herself. She had her school to think about. She had her freedom. She spoke French, he thought irrelevantly. She'd been to France and England and Russia. She might want to go back. Why wouldn't she want that? And he was anchored in West Virginia with a child. Anyway, he and Connie had been stupid in love. Young and stupid, he thought, with a gentle tug of sentiment. He and Kate were grown-ups. Sensible people who enjoyed each other's company. Too sensible to get starry-eyed. The hand that dropped on his shoulder had him jerking and nearly dropping the electric drill on his foot. Geez, O'Connell, got the willies? Hissing out a breath, Brody got to his feet and turned to Jerry Scully. 
Rod's father had been a childhood pal. Even though he was over 30, Jerry maintained his cheerfully youthful looks and goofy smile. It was spread over his face now. I didn't hear you. No kidding. I called you a couple of times. You were in the zone, man. Jerry put his hands on his hips and strutted around the room. Put a suit in tie guy in a construction area, Brody thought, and they looked like strutters. Need a job? I got an extra hammer. Ha ha. It was an old joke. Jerry was a whiz with math, great in social situations, and couldn't unscrew a light bulb without step-by-step -step written instructions. You ever get those shelves up in the laundry room? Brody asked with his tongue in his cheek. They're up. Beth said elves put them in. He cocked his head. You wouldn't know anything about that, would you? I don't hire elves. Their union's a killer. Right. Too bad, because I'm really grateful to those elves for getting Beth off my back. It was all the acknowledgement and thanks either of them required. Downstairs is looking real good, Jerry went on. Carrie's driving Beth and me crazy about starting up with this ballet stuff. I guess it's going to get going next month after all. No reason it can't. We'll be up here a while longer, and there's some outside work yet, but she'll have the main level ready. Brody started to set the next cabinet. What are you doing hanging out in the middle of the afternoon? Banker's hours? Bankers work a lot harder than you think, pal. Soft hands, Brody said, then sniffed. Is that cologne I'm smelling? Aftershave, you barbarian. Anyway, I had an outside meeting. Got done a little early, so I thought I'd come by to see what you're doing with this old place. My bank's money's getting hammered and nailed in here. Brody tossed a grin over his shoulder. That's why the client hired the best. Jerry said something short and rude that symbolized the affection between two men. So, I hear you and the ballerina are doing some pretty regular dancing. Small towns, Brody said, big noses. She's a looker. Jerry wandered closer, watched Brody finesse the angle of the cabinet. You ever seen a real ballet? Nope. I did. My little sister, you remember Tiffany? She took ballet for a few years when we were kids. Did the nutcracker. My parents dragged me along. It had some moments, Jerry remembered. Giant mice, sword fights, big-ass Christmas tree. The rest was just people jumping and twirling, if you ask me. Takes all kinds. Guess so. Anyway, Tiffany just came back home. She's been down in Kentucky the last couple of years. Finally divorced the jerk she married. Going to stay with the folks until she gets her feet back under her. Uh-huh. Brody laid his level across the top of the two cabinets, nodded. So, I was thinking maybe since you're back in the dating swing, you could take her out sometime. Cheer her up a little. A movie, maybe dinner. Hmm. Brody moved the next cabinet to his mark where it would sit under the breakfast bar. That'd be great. She's had a tough time of it, you know. Be nice if she could spend some time with a guy who'd treat her decent. Yeah. She had a little crush on you when we were kids. So you'll give her a call in the next couple of days? Sure. What? Surfacing, Brody glanced back. Give who a call? Jeez, Brody, Tiff, my sister. You're going to give her a call and ask her out? I am? O'Connell, you just said... Wait a minute. Just a minute. Brody set down the drill and tried to catch up. Look, I don't think I can do that. I'm sort of seeing Kate. You're not married to her or living with her or anything. What's the big deal? He was pretty sure there was one. Being out of the stream for a few years didn't mean he didn't remember how it was supposed to work. Moreover, he didn't want to ask Tiffany or anyone else out. But he didn't think Jerry would appreciate him saying that. The thing is, Jerry, I'm not into the dating scene. You're dating the ballerina. No, I'm not. That is, we're just... Perhaps it was best all around that while he was fumbling for an excuse, he looked away from Jerry and saw Kate in the doorway. Ah, Kate. Hi. Hello? Her voice was cool, her eyes hot. Sorry to interrupt. Recognizing a potentially sticky situation, Jerry flashed his smile and prepared to desert his old friend on the battlefield. Hey there, Kate. Good to see you again. Gosh, look at the time. I have to run. I'll get back to you on that, Brody. See you later. He made tracks. Brody picked up his drill again, passed it from hand to hand. That was Jerry. Yes, I'm aware that was Jerry. Setting your cabinets today. I think you made the right choice with the natural cherry. We should have the bedroom closet framed in and the drywall set with the first coat of mud by the end of the day. That's just dandy. Her temper was a live thing, a nest of vipers curling and hissing in her gut. She had no intention of beating them back to keep them from sinking their fangs into Brody. So we're not dating. We're just... She came into the room on the pause. 
Would that have been sleeping together? We're just sleeping together? Or do you have a simpler term for it? Jerry put me on the spot. Really? Is that why you told him so decisively that you and I are sort of seeing each other? I didn't realize that defining our relationship was such a dilemma for you, or that whatever that relationship might be causes you such embarrassment with your friends. Just hold on. He set the drill down again with an impatient snap of metal on wood. If you were going to eavesdrop on a conversation, you should have listened to the whole thing. Jerry wanted me to take his sister out, and I was explaining why that wasn't a good idea. I see. She imagined she could chew every nail in his pouch, then spit them into his eye. First, I wasn't eavesdropping. This is my place, and I have every right to come into any room in it, whenever I like. Second, in your explanation of why going out with Jerry's sister isn't a good idea, did the word no ever enter your head? Yes, no, he corrected, because I wasn't paying, ah, there. You are capable of saying no. Let me tell you something, O'Connell. She punctuated the words by stabbing a finger into his chest. I don't sleep around. Well, who the hell said you did? When I'm with a man, I'm with that man, period. If he is unable or unwilling to agree to do the same, I expect him to be honest enough to say so. I haven't. And I am not an excuse to be pulled out of the bag when you're scrambling to avoid a favor for a friend. So don't think you can ever use me that way, and with your pitiful fumbling sort ofs. And since it appears we aren't dating, you're perfectly free to call Jerry's sister or anyone else. Damn it, which is it? Are you going to be pissed off because I brushed Jerry off or pissed off because I don't? Her hands curled into fists. Punching him, she decided, would only give him delusions of grandeur. Jerk. She bit the single word off, turned on her heel, and, tossing something in Ukrainian over her shoulder, strode out of the room. Females, Brody muttered. He kicked his toolbox and was only moderately satisfied by the clang. An hour later, the cabinets were in place and Brody was at work on the pantry. He'd already run through the scene with Kate a half a dozen times, but with each play he'd remembered things he should have said. Short, pithy statements that would have turned the tide in his favor, and the first chance he got he was going to burn her ears with them. He was not going to grovel, he told himself, as he nailed in the brackets for a shelf. He had nothing to apologize for. Women, he decided, were just one of the many reasons a man was better off going through his life solo. If he was such a jerk, why'd she bother to spend any time with him in the first place? He backed out of the closet, turned, and nearly ran right into Spencer Kimball. What is it with people? Brody demanded. Sorry, I didn't think you could hear me with all the noise. I'm going to post signs. Brody stalked over to select one of the shelves he'd pre-cut and sealed. No suits, no ties, no females. Spencer's eyebrows lifted. In all the months he'd known Brody, this was the first time he'd heard him anything but calm. I take it I'm not the first interruption of the day? Not by a long shot. Brody tested the shelf. It slid smoothly into its slot. At least something was going right today, he thought. If this is about the kitchen design for your place, once you approve it, I'll order materials. We'll be able to start in a couple of weeks. Actually, I'm staying out of that one. Tasha's gotten very territorial over this kitchen deal. I just came by to see the progress here. The considerable progress. Yeah, moving right the hell along. Brody snatched up another shelf, then stopped, let out a breath. Sorry. Bad day. Must be going around. And explained, Spencer decided, why his daughter was in a prickly mood. Kate's downstairs, setting up her office. Oh. Brody carted his shelves into the pantry, began to set them. Very deliberately. I didn't realize she was still here. Furniture she ordered just came in. I didn't get much of a welcome from her either. So, putting the evidence together, I conclude the two of you had an argument. It's not an argument when somebody jumps down somebody else's throat for no good reason. It's an attack. Mm-hmm. At the risk of poking my nose in, I can tell you the women in my family always have what they consider a good reason for jumping down a man's throat. Of course, whether or not it actually is a good reason is debatable, which is why women are just too much damn trouble. Tough doing without them, though, isn't it? I was getting along. Jack and I were doing just fine. Frustration pumped off him as he turned back to Spencer. What is it with women, anyway, that they have to complicate things, then make you feel like an idiot? Son, generations of men have pondered that question. There's only one answer. Because. With a half-laugh, Brody stepped back again, automatically eyeballing the shelves for level and fit. I guess that's as good as it gets. 
doesn't matter much at this point anyway. She dumped me. You don't strike me as a man who typically walks away from a problem. Nothing typical about your daughter. As soon as it was out, Brody winced. Sorry. I took that as a compliment. My impression is the two of you bruised each other's feelings, maybe each other's pride. An insider tip? Kate's usual response to bruised feelings or pride is temper, followed by ice. Brody dug out the hooks to be used in the pantry. He should leave that job for a laborer, he thought, but he needed to do something simple with his hands. She made herself pretty clear. She called me a jerk, then something in Russian, Ukrainian, whatever. She spit at you in Ukrainian? Spence struggled to conceal his amusement. She'd have to have been pretty worked up for that. Brody's eyes narrowed as he hefted his screwdriver. I don't know what it meant, but I didn't like the sound of it. It might have been something about you roasting on a spit over hellfire. Her mother likes to use that one. Brody, do you have feelings for my daughter? Brody's palms went instantly damp. Mr. Kimball, Spence, I know it's not a simple question or an easy one, but I'd like an answer. Would you mind stepping away from the toolbox first? There are a lot of sharp implements in there. Spencer slid his hands into his pockets. You have my word I won't challenge you to a duel with screwdrivers. Okay. I have feelings for Kate. They're kind of murky and unsettled, but I have them. I didn't intend to get involved with her. I'm not in a position to. Can I ask why? That's pretty obvious. I'm a single father. I'm putting together a decent life for my son, but it's nothing like what Kate's used to or what she can have. Spencer rocked back on his heels. They gave you a bad time, didn't they? Excuse me? Unlike some families, ours can be nosy, interfering, protective, and irritating. But you'll also find we respect and support each other's choices and feelings. Brody, it's a mistake to judge one situation by the dynamics of another. Spencer paused for a moment, then continued. But putting that aside for the moment, since you care about Kate, let me give you some unsolicited advice. Whether you want to take it or not is up to you. Deal with the problem. Deal with her. If you didn't matter to her, she'd have ended things gently, or worse, politely. Deciding he'd given Brody enough to think about, Spencer turned to take a survey of the total construction chaos of the kitchen. So this is what I've got to look forward to. He shot Brody a miserable look. And you think you have problems. When Spencer left him alone, Brody stood, tapping the screwdriver on his palm. The man was advising him to fight with his daughter. What kind of a screwy family was that? His own parents never fought. Of course, that was because his father set the rules, and those rules were followed. Or at least it seemed that way. He'd never fought with Connie. Not really. They'd had some disagreements, sure, but they'd just worked through them or talked them out. Or ignored them, Brody admitted. Ignored them, he thought, because they'd both been cut off, isolated, and they only had each other to rely on. Temper had never gotten him anywhere but in trouble. With his father, in school, in the early days on the job, he'd learned to rein it in, to use his head instead of his gut. Most of the time, he admitted, thinking about his last altercation with his father. Still, maybe it was a mistake to compare what had been with what was. One thing was certain, he wasn't going to get rid of this nasty sensation in his gut until he spoke his mind. He checked his men first, ran over some minor adjustments and the basic plan for the following day. It was nearly time to knock off, so he cut them loose. He didn't want an audience. Kate hit the nail squarely on the head and bared her teeth in satisfaction. Brody O'Connell, the pig, wasn't the only one who could use a hammer. She'd spent the last two hours meticulously setting up her office. Everything would be perfect when she was finished. She wouldn't settle for anything less. Her desk was precisely where she wanted it, and its drawers already organized with the brochures she'd designed and ordered, her letterhead, the application forms for students. Her filing cabinet was the same golden oak. In time, she expected the folders inside to be full. She'd found the rug at an antique sale, and its faded pattern of cabbage roses set off the pale green walls, picked up the tone in the fabric of the accent chairs that now faced her desk. Just because it was an office didn't mean it couldn't have style. She hung yet another of the framed black and white photos she'd chosen, stood back and nodded with approval. Dancers at the bar, in rehearsal, on stage, backstage, young students at recitals, lacing on toe shoes. Sweating, sparkling, limp from exertion or flying, 
all the aspects of a dancer's world. They would remind her on a daily basis what she had done and what she was doing. She picked up another nail, set it neatly on her mark, slammed it. And what she wasn't doing, she thought, wrapping it a second time, was wasting her time on Brody O'Connell, the bastard. Let him cozy up to Tiffany. Oh, she remembered Tiffany Scully. The busty, bleached blonde had been a year ahead of her in high school. Lots of giggling, lots of lipstick. Well, let the jerk take her out. What did she care? She was done with him. If you'd told me you were going to cover the entire space with pictures, Brody commented, I wouldn't have worked so hard on finishing the drywall. Nobody'd know the difference. She jammed the photograph in place, picked up another nail. One assumes you have a certain pride in your work, whether or not it can be admired, and since I paid for the wall, I'll do whatever the hell I like with it. Yeah, you want to riddle them with nail holes, it's your choice. The pictures looked great, not that he was going to say so. Not just the arrangement of them, which was cohesive without being rigid, but the theme. He could see her in several of them, as a child, a young girl, a woman. One of her sitting cross-legged on the floor, pounding shoes with a hammer, made him want to grin. Instead, he waved a finger toward it, casually. I thought you were supposed to dance with those. For your information, toe shoes need to be broken in. That's one method of doing so. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'd like to get my office finished. I have appointments here tomorrow afternoon. Then that gives you plenty of time. Particularly, he thought, since the office already looked perfect. He should have known she'd make it perfect. Let me put it this way. She pounded in another nail. I'm busy and I have no desire to talk to you. I'm not paying you to stand around and chat in any case. Don't pull that on me. He yanked the hammer out of her hand. You writing checks for the job doesn't have anything to do with the rest of it. I'll be damned if you'll put it on that level. He was right, of course, and it shamed her to have it pointed out. True enough, but our personal business is done. The hell it is. He turned and shoved the pocket door closed. Just what do you think you're doing? Getting some privacy. It doesn't seem to be in big supply around here. Open that door, then walk through it and keep walking. Sit down and shut up. Her eyes widened, more in shock than temper. I beg your pardon? To solve the problem, he set the hammer aside, well out of her reach, walked over and pushed her into a chair. Now listen. She started to leap up, was pushed down firmly again. Temper heated, but it stayed at the bubble from the sheer surprise of seeing him so furious. So you've proved you're big and strong, she said derisively. You don't have to prove you're stupid, and you don't have to prove you're spoiled and snotty. You try to get up again before I'm done, I'm going to tie you in that chair. I was minding my own business when Jerry came in. He's a friend. He and Beth have gone out of their way for me and Jack, so I owe him. So naturally, you need to pay him back by dating his sister. Be quiet, Kate. I'm not dating his sister. I don't intend to date his sister. He was running off at the mouth, and I was shimming cabinets. I wasn't listening to him, and by the time I tuned back in... Brody raked a hand through his hair, took a restless turn around the room. He caught me off guard, and I was trying to backtrack without stomping all over his feelings. He and Tiff have always been tight. He's worried about her, I guess, and he trusts me. What was I supposed to say? I'm not interested in your sister? Kate angled her chin. Yes, but that's not really the point. Then what the hell is the point? The point is you indicated and obviously feel there's nothing between us but sex. I require more than that in a relationship. I demand more than that. Loyalty, fidelity, affection, respect. I expect a man to be able to say, without tripping over his own clumsy tongue, that he and I are dating, that he cares about me. Damn it, it's been nearly ten years since I dated anyone. You'd think you could cut me some slack. Then you think wrong. Are we done here? Man, you're a hard case. No, we're not done. He yanked her to her feet. I haven't been with anyone else since you. I don't want to be. I'll make a point of making that crystal clear to Jerry or anyone else. I care about you, and I don't appreciate being made to feel like an idiot because I don't have a good handle on it. Fine, now let go. If I could let go, I wouldn't be standing here wanting to strangle you. You insulted me. You insulted us. You're the one who should be strangled. I'm not going to apologize again. He dragged her toward the door. Apologize? I didn't hear any apology. What are you doing? Just be quiet. He ordered as he shoved the door open, continued to pull her down the corridor. If you don't let go of me this minute, I'm going to... The wind was knocked out of her when he simply hauled her up and over his shoulder. He clamped her legs still with one arm, yanked open the front door with his free hand. Have you lost your mind? 
Too shocked to struggle, she shoved her hair up out of her face as he strode with her across the porch and down the front steps. Have you completely lost your mind? The minute I started thinking about you. He scanned the street, spotted a woman coming out of the apartment building. Excuse me, ma'am? She glanced over, blinked. Uh, yes? This is Kate. I'm Brody. I just wanted you to know that we're dating. Oh, my God. Kate whispered and let her hair fall again. I see. Well, the woman smiled, offered a little wave. That's nice. Thanks. Brody shifted Kate, set her on her feet in front of him. Would you like to keep going, or are you satisfied? She couldn't get the words out of her mouth, simply couldn't shove them from where they seemed to be stuck in her throat. She solved the problem by wrapping a fist against his chest and storming back into the building. Guess not, Brody decided, and strode in after her. Chapter 9 He caught her an instant before she could slam her office door in his face. Not that it would have stopped him now that he was revved up. Not so fast, honey. Don't you call me honey. Don't you speak to me, she rounded on him. You're nothing but a bully, manhandling me that way, embarrassing me on the street. Embarrassed? He kept his eyes, every bit as hot as hers, level as he slid the door closed behind his back. Why is that? I simply told a neighbor without tripping over my, what was it, clumsy tongue, that we're dating. So what's the problem? The problem is... She retreated several steps as he advanced on her. That was another shocker. Not just that he was backing her into a corner, but that she was letting him. She'd never backed down from a confrontation, and certainly never backed down from a man. Just what do you think you're doing? Being myself. Damned if it didn't feel good. Been a while since I cut loose like this, but it's coming back to me. We may as well find out now if you have a problem with that. If you think you can... She broke off as he grabbed her arms, pulled her up to her toes. You'd just better calm down. You'd just better catch up. He crushed his mouth to hers and felt her instinctive jerk of protest. Ignored it. You got a problem with it? He demanded, lifting his head and meeting her eyes. Brody. That was all she managed to say before he took her mouth over again. Yes or no? I don't... His teeth scraped along her neck. Oh, God. She couldn't think. This had to be wrong. There had to be a dozen, two dozen rational reasons why this was wrong. She'd worry about them later. You want me to take my hands off you? They moved over her, rough and possessive. Yes or no? Pick now. No, damn it. She fisted her hands in his hair and dragged his mouth back to hers. She didn't know who pulled whom to the floor. It didn't seem to matter. She couldn't tell whose hands were more impatient as they tugged at clothing. She didn't care. All she knew was she wanted this rough, angry man every bit as much as she'd wanted the gentle, patient one. Her body was quaking for him, her heart bounding. So much heat. She was amazed her system didn't simply implode from it. The sharp stabs of pain and pleasure fused together into one unbearable sensation. Tangled together, they rolled over the floor. She set her teeth at his shoulder, craving that wild flavor of flesh. He'd forgotten what it was to let himself want like this, to take like this. Without restriction or boundaries, to rush and plunder, his fingers tore at the triangle of lace that blocked her from him, and he drove her up, hard and high. The bite of her nails on his back was a dark thrill, the blind shock in her eyes a violent triumph. Desperate for possession, he yanked up her hips and plunged. She rose up, that agile body quivering, her fingers digging into the rug for stability as he pounded into her, an elemental mating that fed on hot blood. Even as she cried out, he dragged her up until her legs wrapped around his waist, her hands found slippery purchase on his sweat-slicked shoulders. She held on, riding the razor-tipped edge of pleasure, clinging to it, to him. When the climax ripped through her, shredding her system to tatters, she bowed back and let him take his own. She melted like candle wax onto the floor when he released her, then simply lay there, weak and sated. She'd been ravaged, she had allowed it, and she felt wonderful. Though his vision was still a little blurry at the edges, Brody studied her, then what was left of their clothes. I ripped your shirt. When her eyes fluttered open, he recognized the lazy gleam of a satisfied woman. And these things... He held up the tatters of her panties. Well, I'm not going to apologize. I didn't ask for an apology. 
Good, because if you had, I'd have been forced to haul you outside again, naked this time, to find another neighbor. Instead, you can borrow my shirt. I've got a spare in the truck. She sat up, took the offered shirt. The glow she'd felt was beginning to fade. Are we still fighting? I'm done, so I guess that's up to you. She looked up. His eyes were clear now and direct. This time it was she who fumbled, starting to speak, then shaking her head. No, go on, say it. Let's make sure the air's completely clear. You hurt my feelings. It was lowering to admit it. Temper, she thought, was so much easier to handle than hurt. I get that. He took the shirt from her, draped it over her shoulders. And that's something I will apologize for. If it helps any, you hurt mine right back. What are we doing, Brody? Trying to figure each other out, I guess. I'm not embarrassed by what we've got going on, Kate. I don't want you to think that. But I don't have a handle on it yet. All right. That's fair enough. But it hurt a lot, she realized, as she shrugged into the borrowed shirt. Hurt that she'd fallen in love and he hadn't. Still, that didn't mean he wouldn't. She smiled a little, leaned over, and up to kiss him. You're not a jerk. I'm sorry I called you one. He caught her chin. You called me something worse than that, didn't you? Now the smile spread and was genuine. Maybe. I'm going to buy a Ukrainian phrase book. Good luck. Besides, they just don't have certain descriptive words and phrases in there. I'm getting one anyway. He got to his feet, drew her up to hers. I've got to go pick up my kid. His hair was a sexy mess, his eyes lazily satisfied. He was naked to the waist, and she thought he was a father who had to pick up his little boy from the school bus. That's part of it, isn't it? Part of your problem with getting a grip on our relationship, trying to juggle the man and the father together. Maybe. Yes, he admitted. Kate, there hasn't been anyone in... He lifted a hand, smoothed it over his hair in some attempt to order it. Connie was sick for a long time. He couldn't talk about that now, couldn't go back there. Jack had a rough start. I guess we both did. All I can do is make up for it. You have, and you are. I know how to juggle too, Brody. I think we can keep the balls in the air, as long as we both want to. I want to. Her heart settled. Then that's also fair enough. Go get Jack. Yeah. His gaze skimmed down. Before I do, I'd just like to say you sure look good in flannel. Thanks. You want to lift home? No, I really do have some things to finish up here. All right. He lowered his head, touched his mouth to hers, ended up lingering. Gotta go. But when he got to the door, he glanced back. You want to go out Saturday night? Her eyebrow lifted. It was the first time he'd actually asked her out. It was, she supposed, some sort of progress. I'd love to. How it got to be spring break when it seemed they'd just gotten through Christmas vacation, Brody didn't know. School days had certainly not flown by when he'd been a kid. Added to that, the Scullies had decided to take advantage of the time off to take the kids to Disney World. This had caused major problems with Jack, who'd begged, pleaded, and had fallen back on whining over the idea that they should go too. Brody had explained why it wasn't possible just now, patiently sympathized, then had fallen back on the parental cop-out, because I said so, when the siege had shown no sign of ending. As a result, he'd had a sulky kid on his hands for two days and a raging case of the guilt. The combination made it very crowded in the small bathroom where he was trying to lay tile. You never let me go anywhere, Jack complained. He was thoroughly bored with the small pile of toys he'd been allowed to bring along. Usually he liked coming to the job with his dad, but not when his best friend was in Disney World riding on Space Mountain. It was a jip, a big fat jip, he thought, relishing one of the words he'd picked up from the crew. When his father ignored him and continued to lay tile, Jack stuck out his bottom lip. How come I couldn't go to Grandma's? I told you Grandma was busy this morning. She's going to come by and pick you up in a couple of hours. Then you can go over to her house. Thank God. I don't want to stay here. It's boring. It's not fair I gotta stay here and do nothing while everybody else has fun. I never get to do anything. Brody shoved his trowel into the tray of adhesive. Look, I've got a job to do. A job that sees to it you eat regular. Damn it. How was his father's voice suddenly coming out of his mouth? I'm stuck with it, he added, and so are you. 
Now keep it up, Jack. Just keep it up and you won't be going anywhere. Grandpa gave me five dollars, Jack said, tearing up. So you don't have to buy me any food. Great. Terrific. I'll retire tomorrow. Grandma and Grandpa can take me to Disney World and you can't go. They're not taking you anywhere, Brody snapped, cut to the bone by the childish slap. You'll be lucky to go to Disney World by the time you're 30. Now cut it out. I want Grandma. I want to go home. I don't like you anymore. Kate walked in on that and the resulting angry, tired tears. She took one look at Brody's exhausted, frustrated face, the cranky little boy sprawled weeping on the floor, and stepped into the fray. What's all this, handsome Jack? I want to go to Disney World. He sobbed it out between hiccups. Even as Brody got to his feet to deal with it, Kate crouched down between father and son. Oh boy, me too. I bet we'd all like to go there more than any place. Dad doesn't. Sure he does. Dads like to go most of all. That's why it's harder for them, because they have to work. Kate, I can handle this. Who said you couldn't? She muttered, but picked up the boy and got to her feet. I bet you're tired of being cooped up, aren't you, baby? Why don't we go to my house a while and let Dad finish his work? My mother's coming by to get him in a couple of hours. Just let me... He reached for his son, who only curled himself like a snake around Kate and effectively cut his heart in two. One look at the blank hurt on Brody's face made her want to sandwich Jack between them in a hard hug. But that, she thought, wasn't the immediate answer. Distance was. I'm done here for the day, Brody. Why don't you let Jack come home with me? Keep me company. Take a nap, she mouthed. I'll call your mother and ask her to pick him up at my house instead. I want to go with Kate, Jack sobbed against her shoulder. Fine. Great. The miserable mix of temper and guilt had him snatching up his trowel again. Very much, Kate thought, like a cranky boy. Thanks. He sat down heavily on an overturned bucket as he heard Jack sniffle out as Kate carried him off. My daddy yelled at me. Yes, I know. She kissed Jack's hot, wet cheek as she walked downstairs. You yelled at him, too. I bet he feels just as sad as you do. Nuh-uh. With a heavy, heavy sigh, Jack rested his head on Kate's shoulder. He wouldn't take me to Disney World like Rod. I know. I guess that's my fault. How come? Well, your dad's doing this job for me, and he promised me it would be done by a certain time. Because he promised, I made promises to other people who are depending on me now. If your dad broke his promise to me, then I broke mine to the other people. That wouldn't be right. Would it, Jack? No. But maybe just this one time. Does your dad break his promises to you? No. Jack's head drooped. Don't be sad, handsome Jack. When we get to my house, we're going to read a story about another Jack, the one with the beanstalk. Can I have a cookie? Yes. In love, she gave him a hard squeeze. He was asleep almost before Jack sold his cow for magic beans. Poor little boy, she thought, tucking a light throw over him. Poor Brody. She began to think she hadn't given the man enough credit. Parenthood wasn't all wrestling on the floor and ball games in the yard. It was also tears and tantrums, disappointments and discipline. It was saying no, having to say no when your heart wanted to say yes. You're so well loved, handsome Jack, she murmured and bent over to kiss the top of his head. He needs you to know that. And so is he, she thought with a sigh. I wish the man would buy a clue because I'm not waiting much longer. I want both of you. When the phone rang, she snatched it from the cradle. Hello? Ah. Smiling now, she walked out of the room so as not to disturb Jack. Davidif, what have I done to deserve a call from the master? Later, though she admitted it was foolish, Kate freshened her makeup and tidied her hair. It was the first time she would meet Brody's parents. Since she intended for them to be her in-laws, she wanted to make a good impression. Jack had wakened from his nap energized. This had called for some running around the backyard, a fierce battle with action figures, and a race with miniature cars that had resulted in a satisfying wreck of major proportions. They finished the entertainment off with a snack in the kitchen. My dad's mad at me, Jack confided over slices of apple and cheese. I don't think so. I think he's a little upset because he couldn't give you what you wanted. Inside, parents want to give their children everything that would make them happy, but sometimes they can't. She remembered throwing some impressive tantrums herself, snarls followed by sulks, and ending, she thought, like this in guilty unhappiness. 
Sometimes they can't because it's not the best thing or the right thing just then, and sometimes because they just can't. When your little boy cries and yells and stomps his feet, it makes you mad for a while, but it also hurts your heart. Jack lifted his face, all big eyes and trembling lips. I didn't mean to. I know, and I bet if you tell him you're sorry, you'll both feel better. Did your dad ever yell at you? Yes, he did, and it made me mad or unhappy. But after a while, I usually figured out I deserved it. Did I deserve it? Yes, I'm afraid you did. There was this one thing I always knew, even when I was mad or unhappy. I knew my dad loved me. You know that about your dad, too. Yeah. Jack nodded solemnly. We're a team. You're a great team. Jack turned his apple slices around, making pictures and patterns. She was pretty, he thought, and she was nice. She could play games and read stories. He even liked when she kissed him and the way she laughed when he pretended not to like it. Dad liked to kiss her, too. He said he did, and he didn't lie. So she could maybe marry his dad, even though Dad said she wasn't going to, and then she could be Dad's wife and Jack's mother. They'd all live together in the big house. And maybe, sometime, they could all go to Disney World. What are you thinking about so hard, handsome Jack? I was wondering if... Oops. She smiled, rising as she heard the doorbell. Hold that thought, okay? That must be your grandma. She gave Jack's hair a quick rub and hurried out to answer. With her hand on the knob, she took a quick, bracing breath. Silly to be nervous, she told herself. Then opened the door to Mr. and Mrs. O'Connell. Hi, it's good to see you. She stepped back in invitation. Jack's just in the kitchen, having a snack. It's good of you to watch him for Brody. Mary O'Connell stepped inside, tried not to make her quick scan of the entrance too obvious. She'd fussed with her makeup, too, much to her husband's disgust. I enjoy spending time with Jack. He's great company. Please come on back. Have some coffee. Don't want to put you out, Bob said. He'd been in the house plenty. When you fixed people's toilets, you weren't particularly impressed by their doodads and furniture. I've got a fresh pot. Please come in, unless you're in a hurry. We've got to... Bob broke off as his wife gave him a subtle elbow nudge. We'd love a cup of coffee, thank you. Brody's going to be remodeling the kitchen for my mother, Kate began as they walked back. My parents love the work he's done in the rest of the house. He always was good with his hands, Mary commented, and gave her husband a quiet look when he folded his lips tight. He's certainly transformed the old house I bought. Hey, Jack, look who I've got. Hi, Jack slurped his chocolate milk. I've been playing with Kate. Like father, like son, Bob thought sourly, but his heart lifted as it always did at the sight of Jack's beaming face. Where'd you get the chocolate cow, partner? Oh, we keep her in the garden shed, Kate said as she got out cups and saucers, and milk her twice a day. Kate's got toys. Her mom has a whole store of toys. She said how on my birthday we can go there and I can pick one out. Isn't that nice? Mary slid her gaze toward Kate, speculated. How is your mother, Kate? She's fine, thanks. Mary approved of the way Kate set out the cups, the cream and sugar. Classy, but not fussy. And the ease with which she handed Jack a dish rag so he could wipe up a bit of spilled milk himself. Good potential mother material, she decided. God knew her little lamb deserved one. As for potential wife material, well, she would see what she would see. Everyone's talking about your ballet school, she began, flushing slightly at her husband's soft snort. You must be excited. I am. I've got several students lined up, and classes begin in just a few weeks. If you know anyone who might be interested, I'd appreciate it if you'd spread the word. Shepherdstown's some different from New York City, Bob said as he reached for the sugar. It certainly is. Kate's voice was smooth and easy, though she'd heard the snort. I enjoyed living in New York, working there. Of course, it helped considerably that I had family there as well. And I liked the traveling, seeing new places, having the opportunity to dance on the great stages. But this is home, and where I want to be. Do you think ballet is out of place here, Mr. O'Connell? He shrugged. Don't know anything about it. It happens I do, and I think a good school of dance will do very well here. We're a small town, of course, she added, sipping her coffee. But we're also a college town. The university brings in a variety of people from a variety of places. Can I have a cookie? Please, Jack's grandmother added. Can I please have a cookie? Kate started to rise, then let out a gasp as she saw Brody through the glass on the back door. 
With a shake of her head, she walked over to open it. You gave me such a jolt. Sorry. He was a little out of breath, more from excitement than the quick jog around the house. I tried to call you. He said, nodding and greeting to his parents. To head you off, you must have been on the road. Said we were coming to pick up the boy at three, Bob said. Got here at three. Yeah, well, I had a little change of plans. He looked at his son, who sat with his eyes on his plate and his chin nearly on his chest. Did you have a good time with Kate, Jack? Jack nodded his head, slowly looked up. His eyes were teary again. I'm sorry I was bad. I'm sorry I hurt your heart. Brody crouched down, cupped Jack's face. I'm sorry I can't take you to Disney World. I'm sorry I yelled at you. You're not mad at me anymore? No, I'm not mad at you. The tears dried up. Kate said you weren't. Kate was right. He picked Jack out of the chair for a hug before setting him on his feet. Can I go back to work with you? I won't be bad. Well, you could, except I'm not going back to work today. Man knocks off middle of the afternoon isn't putting in a good day's work. Brody glanced over at his father, nodded. True enough, and a man who doesn't take a few hours now and then to be with his son isn't working hard enough at being a father. You always had food in your belly, Bob shot back as he shoved away from the table. You're right. I want Jack to be able to say more than that about me. I've got something for you, he added, cupping Jack's chin as it had begun to wobble as it always did when Brody and his father exchanged words. It isn't Disney World, but I think you'll like it even better than a ride on Space Mountain. Is it a new action figure? Thrilled, he began tugging at Brody's pockets. Nope. A car? A truck? You are way off, and it's not in my pocket. It's outside on the porch. Can I see? Can I? He was already running for the door, tugging the knob. And when he opened it, looked down, looked up again at his father, Brody had, in that wonderful moment of stupefied delight, everything that mattered. A puppy! A puppy! Jack scooped up the black ball of fur that was trying to climb up his leg. Is it mine? Can I keep him? Looks like he wants to keep you, Brody commented as the pup wriggled in ecstasy, yipping and bathing Jack's face with his tongue. Look, Grandma, I got a puppy and he's mine, and his name is Mike, just like I always wanted. He sure is a pretty little thing. Oh, just look at those feet. Why, he'll be bigger than you before long. You have to be real good to him, Jack. I will, I promise. Look, Kate, look at Mike. He's great. Unable to resist, she got down and was treated to some puppy kisses. So soft, so sweet. She turned her head, met Brody's eyes. Very, very sweet. It's a good thing for a boy to have a dog. Still stinging from his son's comment, Bob gestured. But who's going to tend to it when Jack's in school all day and you're working? Problem with you is you never think things through. Just do what you want at the moment you want it and don't consider. Bob. Mortified, Mary reached up to pat her husband's arm. I have a fenced yard, Brody said carefully, and I've worked on plenty of jobs where dogs were around. He'll come with me till he's old enough to be on his own. You buy that dog for the boy or to patch up your conscience because you can't give him a holiday like his friends. I don't want to go to Disney World, Jack said in a quavering voice. I want to stay home with Dad and Mike. Why don't you take Mike outside, Jack? Fixing a smile on her face, Kate walked to the door. Puppies like to run around as much as boys do, and you need to get acquainted. Here, put on your jacket first. Brody held it in until Kate nudged the boy out the door. It's none of your business if I get my son a dog, or why. But the fact is, I had this one picked out from a litter three weeks ago for him and was waiting until he was weaned. I was going to pick him up Sunday for Easter, but Jack needed a little cheering up today. You're not teaching him respect by giving him presents after he's sassed you. All you taught me was respect, and look where that got us. Please. Mary all but wrung her hands. This isn't the place. Don't you tell me where I can speak my mind, Bob snapped. My mistake was in not slapping you back harder and more often. You always did run your own way as you pleased. Nothing but trouble causing it and finding it and giving your mother heartache. Run off to the city before you're dry behind the ears and pissing your life away. I didn't run off to the city. I ran away from you. Bob's head jerked back at that as if he'd been slapped. He went pale. Now you're back, aren't you? Scrambling to make do, shuffling the boy off to neighbors so you can make a living, stirring up gossip because you're fooling around with women down the hall from where that boy sleeps and teaching him to run wild as you did and end up the same way. Just one minute. If her own temper hadn't hazed her vision, Kate would have realized she was stepping between two men very near to coming to blows. 
It so happens Brody isn't fooling around with women, he's fooling around with me. And though that is none of your business, the fooling around has never gone on when Jack's asleep down the hall. And if you don't know that Brody would cut his own arm off rather than do anything, anything to hurt that child, then you're blind as well as stupid. You should be ashamed to speak to him as you did, to not have the guts to tell him you're proud of what he's making out of his life, and of the life he's making for his son. You're wasting your breath. Brody began, and she rounded on him. You shut up. You've plenty to answer for, too. You have no right to speak to your father as you did. No right whatsoever to show him disrespect. And in front of your own child. Don't you see that it frightens and hurts Jack to watch the two of you claw at each other this way? She spun back, searing both of them with one hot look. The pair of you haven't got enough sense put together to equal the brains of a monkey. I'm going outside with Jack. As far as I'm concerned, the two of you can pound each other into mush and be done with it. She wrenched open the door and sailed outside. She was still simmering when Brody joined her a few minutes later. Saying nothing, he watched Jack wrestle with the puppy and try to get Mike to chase a small red ball. I want to apologize for bringing that into your house. My house has heard family arguments before, and I expect it will hear them again. You were right about it being wrong for us to start on each other in front of Jack. When she said nothing, he jammed his hands into his pockets. Kate, that's just the way it is between me and my father. The way it's always been. And because it's been that way, it has to continue to be? If you can change one aspect of your life, Brody, you can change others. You just have to try harder. We grade each other, that's all. We're better when we keep our distance. I don't want Jack to feel that way about me. Maybe I overcompensate. Stop it. Impatient again, she turned to him. Is that a happy, well-adjusted, healthy boy? Yeah. Brody had to smile as Jack filled the air with belly laughs as he rolled over the grass with the puppy climbing all over him. You know you're a good father. It's taken work and effort, but for the most part, it's easy for you, because you love him unconditionally. It's a lot more work, a lot more effort, Brody, for you to be a good son, because there are a lot of conditions on the love you have for your father and his for you. We don't love each other. Oh, you're wrong. If you didn't, you couldn't hurt each other. Brody shrugged that off. She didn't understand, he thought. How could she? First time I've ever seen him shocked speechless. I don't believe he's ever had a woman rip into him that way. Me, I'm getting used to it. Good. Now, if you don't want me ripping into you again anytime soon, you'll apologize to your mother at the first opportunity. You embarrassed her. Man, you're strict. Mind if I play with my dog first? She arched a brow. Whose dog? Jack's. But Jack and I, we're... A team, she finished. Yes, I know. Chapter 10 Kate made her plans, bided her time, and chose her moment. She knew it was calculated, but really, what was wrong with that? Timing, approach, method, they were essential to any plan. So if she'd waited for that particular moment on a Friday night when Jack was enjoying a night over at his grandparents and Brody was relaxed after a particularly intense bout of lovemaking, it was simply rational planning. I've got something for you. Something else? He was, as Jerry would have said, in the zone. I get dinner, a bottle of wine, and a night with a beautiful woman. I don't think there is anything else. With a quiet laugh, she slipped out of bed. Oh, but there is. He watched her. Always he enjoyed watching the way she moved. He'd come to the conclusion there was more to this ballet business than he'd once thought. It gave him a great deal of pleasure to see her here in his room, the room he thought he'd been squeezing in hours late at night to finish. He was doing, thank you, God, a lot more than sleeping there now. The walls were finished and painted a strong deep blue. Kate favored strong colors. The woodwork, stripped down to its natural tone and glossily sealed, was a good accent. He hoped to get to the floors soon. Curtains and that kind of thing would be dealt with eventually. But for now, he just liked seeing her in here, the dusky skin against the smooth blue walls and the way the shimmer of light from the low fire danced in shadows. She'd left her earrings on his dresser once. It had given him a hell of a jolt to see them there the next morning. They'd looked so... female, he remembered. Yet he'd been foolishly disappointed when she'd removed them. What that had to say about him, about things, he'd just have to figure out. She put on his shirt against the light chill of the room and walked over to her purse. I'm going to buy you a half dozen flannel shirts, Brody decided, just so I can see you walking around naked under them. 
I'll take them. She sat back on the bed and dropped an envelope on his bare chest. And these are for you. What? Baffled, he sat up, tapped out the contents. The two airline tickets only increased his confusion. What's this? Two tickets on the shuttle to New York, next Friday. One for you, one for Jack. He eyed them, then eyed her. Cautiously, because? Because I really want both of you to come. Have you ever been to New York? No, but even better. I get to introduce it to both of you. The director of my former company called me earlier in the week, she explained. They're putting on a special performance, one show only next Saturday night. It's for charity. There'll be several selections from several ballets performed by different artists. He'd asked me to participate some time ago, but I passed. So much going on, and it's all but running into the opening of my school. But now you decided not to pass. The dancer who was to perform the pas de deux from the Red Rose, that's a ballet Davida first performed with his wife when they were partners, is out with an injury. It's not career-ending, thank God, but she can't dance for at least two weeks. That's put her out. He's asked me to fill in. Simple, she thought. It was all very simple, and she wasn't going to give Brody any wiggle room. I've danced this part several times. Fact is, it's what he asked me to perform originally. So when he called, I didn't want to say no. Then, of course, he talked me into doing another segment from Don Quixote. I should leave Monday to get in shape for it, but I couldn't shuffle everything, so I'm leaving Tuesday. He felt a little twinge in the gut at the thought of her leaving again. You'll be great. But listen, Kate, I appreciate the gesture, but I just can't grab Jack and take off to New York like that. Why not? Well, work, school, for starters, a new puppy for another, your basics. You can leave after school on Friday and be in New York before dinner. We can stay at my sister's. Saturday, you can see some of the city, maybe take Jack to the top of the Empire State Building. Saturday night, you come to the ballet. Sunday, we see a little more of the city, go have dinner at my grandparents, catch the late shuttle back. Everyone's at school or work Monday. She moved her shoulders. Oh, and as for Mike, you bring him, of course. Bring a dog to New York? Sure, my sister's kids will love it. He felt as though he were sitting in a box and she was slowly closing the lid. Kate, it's just not the kind of thing people like me do, flying off to New York for the weekend. It's not a flight to Mars, O'Connell. Laughing, she leaned over and kissed him. It's a little adventure. Jack will love it, and... She saved the coup de grace, as any good general. He'll be able to give his pal Rod a little back for all the bragging about Disney World. Jack will see where King Kong fell to his tragic death. It hit the mark and had Brody struggling not to squirm. Forget the box, he thought. Now he felt like a fish with a hook firmly lodged in his mouth. Don't take this the wrong way, okay? But I'm really not into ballet. Oh. She smiled, fluttered her lashes. Which ones have you seen? I haven't seen a public hanging either, but I don't think I'd get much of a charge out of it. Think of it this way. You'll be able to give Jack his first look at New York. You'll have two days to enjoy yourself and only about two hours to be bored senseless. Not a bad deal. You've never seen me dance, she added, linking her fingers with his. I'd like you to. He frowned at the tickets, shook his head. Hit all the angles, didn't you? I don't think I missed any. Is it a deal? Wait till Jack hears he's going to take his first plane trip. He'll flip. He did more than flip. By the time they were shuffling onto the plane on Friday afternoon, he was all but turning himself inside out. Dad, can't you ask if Mike can ride up with us? He's going to be scared in that box. Jack, I told you it's not allowed. He'll be fine, I promise. Remember, he's got his toys, and now those other two dogs are riding in the dog seats with him. Yeah, I guess. Jack's eyes were huge with wonder, excitement, and trepidation as they stepped through the doorway and onto the plane. Look, he said in a desperate whisper, there's the pilot, guys. The flight attendant clued in instantly. Jack was treated to a tour of the cockpit and given a pair of plastic wings. By the time they were preparing for takeoff, he'd decided to be an airline pilot. For the next 50 minutes, he peppered his father with questions, often with his face pressed up to the window. Brody's ears were ringing by the time they touched down, but he had to admit Jack was having the time of his life. Now all he had to do was get through the next couple of days outnumbered by Kate's family. If that wasn't enough to give a guy a headache, there was always the ballet.
What the hell are you doing here, O'Connell? He asked himself with a quick twinge of panic. A weekend in New York? The ballet? For God's sake, why aren't you home sanding drywall and thinking about making a Friday night pizza? Because of Kate, he admitted, and the panic bumped up into his throat. Somehow she'd changed everything. With the carry-on in one hand and Jack's hand gripped firmly in the other, Brody came through the gate. He ordered himself to be calm, it was only a couple of days after all, and looked for Kate. When a tall blonde man waved, Brody flipped through his memory files and tried to put a name to Kate's brother-in-law. Nick LeBeck. Nick tugged Brody's bag free to take it himself. You guys are bunking at our place. Kate wanted to pick you up herself, but she got hung up at rehearsal. We appreciate you coming out. We could have taken a cab. No problem. Any more luggage? Just Mike. Right. Grinning, Nick leaned down to shake Jack's hand. Good to see you. Max is pretty excited about you coming to visit. You met him on New Year's. Uh-huh. And Kate said we can have, like, a sleepover for two nights. Yeah. We're having a big celebration dinner, too. You like fish head soup? Jack's eyes went huge. Slowly, he shook his head. Good, because we're not having any. Let's go spring Mike. It wasn't as awkward as he'd expected it to be to find himself dumped in a strange city in a strange house with people he barely knew. Jack dived right in, picking up his fledgling friendship with Max as if they'd just parted the day before. Mike was a huge hit, and in a buzz of excitement at the attention, peed on the rug. I'm really sorry. He's almost housebroken. So are my kids. Freddy told Brody and handed him a damp rag. We're used to spills around here, of all natures, so relax. To Brody's surprise, he did. It was interesting and entertaining to watch Jack interact with the family, to see how he slid into the mix with a brother and sister. It was cute the way he played with three-year-old Kelsey, kind of like he was trying out his big brother muscles. It wasn't always easy, Brody mused, being an only child. Want to escape? Nick asked and jerked his head. As he walked out of the playroom, he called out, You break it, you buy it. Laughing moans followed them out. He took Brody into the music room with its battered piano, one he'd kept more than a decade out of sentiment, and its wide, deep leather chairs. There were gleaming Tonys on a shelf and a clutter of sheet music on a bench. Nick walked over to a clear-fronted mini-fridge. Beer? Oh, Brody said with feeling, yeah. Traveling with kids separates the men from the boys. Nick popped tops, offered a bottle. Let's hear it for keeping them separate for ten blissful minutes. He never stopped talking, not from the minute I picked him up from school. I think he broke his own record. Wait till you try transatlantic. Nine hours trapped on a plane with Max and Kelsey. He shuddered. Do you know how many questions can be asked in nine uninterrupted hours? No, let's not think about it. It'll give us both nightmares. At Nick's gesture, Brody sank gratefully into one of the chairs. It's a great place you've got here. I guess when I think of New York, I think of little apartments where the windows all face a brick building or big, sleek skyscrapers. We got all of that. When Freddie and I started riding together, I was living over my brother's bar, Lower East Side. Great bar, Nick added, and not a half-bad apartment. But it's not the kind of place you want to try to raise a couple of kids. He glanced up, grinned. Ah, here's the prima now. Sorry I'm late. Kate rushed in, gave Nick a quick peck on the cheek, then turned, bent, and gave Brody a much longer kiss. And sorry I couldn't pick you up. Davidov's having one of his moments. The man can drive you to drink. Nick, my hero, if you get me a glass of wine, I'll be your slave. Sounds like a deal. Tell Freddy I'll be back in after I catch my breath. Sit, he ordered, and nudged her into the chair he vacated. Rest those million-dollar feet. You bet I will. She groaned and leaned over to slip off her shoes as Nick left the room. Brody swore and was instantly on his knees in front of her, lifted her foot in his hand. What the hell have you done? Her feet were bandaged and raw. I danced. Until your feet bleed, he demanded. Why, yes, when necessary. With Davidov, it's often necessary. He ought to be shot. Mm. She leaned back, closed her eyes. I considered it a number of times over the last couple days. Ballet isn't for wimps, O'Connell and aching, bleeding feet are part of the job description. That's ridiculous. That's the life. She leaned over again, kissed his forehead. Don't worry, they heal. How the hell are you supposed to dance on these tomorrow night? Magnificently, she told him, then let out a huge sigh of gratitude when Nick came back. My prince. 
Brody thinks Davidov should be shot. So you've said, plenty. Nick glanced down at her feet, winced. God, what a mess. Want some ice? No, thanks. I'll baby them later. You're going to take care of them right now. To settle the matter, Brody got up, plucked her out of the chair and into his arms. Oh, really, Brody, get a grip. Just be quiet, he ordered, and carried her out of the room. Nick tipped back his beer. Man, he is toast. He hurried off to find his wife and tell her. It was so romantic. Freddie's heart continued to sigh over it now, hours later, as she and Nick prepared for bed. He just carried her right into the kitchen with that wonderful scowl on his face and demanded where he could find a basin and so on to soak Kate's poor feet. I told you. Absently, Nick wrapped a fist on the wall that adjoined their room with his sons, but he didn't really expect it to quiet the racket on the other side for long. The man's a goner. End of Side 3 Side 4 Considering Kate by Nora Roberts Continuing on page 194 And the way he looks at her, especially when he thinks no one, particularly Kate, is paying attention. Like he could just gobble her up in one big bite. It's great. Nick stopped scratching his belly and frowned. I look at you that way. Freddy sniffed and started to turn down the bed. Yeah, right. Hey. He walked over, turned her around by the shoulder. Right here, he instructed, pointing at his own face, then attempting a smoldering look. See? She snorted. Yeah, that's it, all right. I am a puddle. Are you insinuating that I'm not romantic? Are you saying the hammer swingers got me beat in that department? Enjoying herself, Freddie rolled her eyes. Please, she said, and wandered over to the dresser to run a brush through her hair. The next thing she knew, she was being swept off her feet. Her surprised yelp was muffled against his very determined mouth. You want romance, pal? Boy, are you going to get it. At the other end of the hall, as children finally fell into reluctant and exhausted sleep, Kate belted her robe. She'd put in several long, hard days, days that wore the body to a nub and left the mind fussy with fatigue. But now, knowing Brody was just a few steps away, she was restless and needy. She imagined he'd consider sneaking into her room rude, but that didn't mean she couldn't sneak into his. She slipped from her room, walked quietly down the hall to peek in on the children, even the dog, she noted, was sprawled out limply. Satisfied, she eased out again and made her way to Brody's door. No light shone under it. Well, if she had to wake him up, she had to wake him up. She opened it, a little creak of sound, and stepped in just as he turned from the window. He'd been thinking of her, nothing new there, he admitted, and stood now wearing only his jeans loosened at the waist. His mouth went dry as he saw her reach behind and flip the lock. Kate, the kids, out for the count. She'd bought the robe only the day before on an hour break, a ridiculous extravagance of peach-colored silk. But seeing the way his eyes darkened, hearing the way it whispered as she crossed the room, she considered it worth every penny. I just checked on them, she said, and ran her hands up his chest. And if they wake up, one of the four of us will take care of it. Taking in the view? It's pretty spectacular. He took her hands. I was just thinking I'd never be able to sleep tonight, knowing you were so close and not being able to touch you. Touch me now, and neither one of us will worry about sleep tonight. He wondered how he had ever considered resisting her. She was every fantasy, every dream, every wish, all silk and shadows. And she was real, as real as that warm, yielding mouth, those long, sculpted arms. With her, all the years of emptiness, all the lonely nights were locked away. He slipped the silk from her shoulders and found only Kate beneath. Curves and muscle, sighs and trembles... He slid into the bed with her and into that intimate world they created together. Perfumed flesh, soft stroking hands. She was a wonder to him, a smoky-eyed seductress who could beckon with a look. A strong-minded woman who refused to back down from a fight. An open-hearted friend with strong shoulders and a steady hand. He could no longer imagine what his life would be like if she stepped back out of it. Knowing it, finally admitting it to himself, he gathered her close and just held. Brody. Kate brushed her fingers through his hair. His arms had tightened around her so fiercely she wondered why she didn't simply snap in two. What is it? Nothing. He pressed his lips to the side of her neck and ordered himself not to think. For God's sake, don't think now. It's nothing. I want you. 
It's like starving the way I want you. His mouth took hers now, hot, ravenous, burning away all thoughts, all reason. There was something different happening between them, something more. But he was whipping her over the edge so fast with a kind of quiet intensity that was kin to desperation. She could do nothing but feel, nothing but respond. Her heart, already lost to him, bounded like a deer. City lights glanced against the dark windows. The sounds of traffic hummed on the street below. Whatever life pulsed there meant nothing in this tangle of sheets and needs. She rose over him, slim and pale in the shadows. Her hair was a dark fall, tumbling down her back, then sliding forward to curtain them both as she leaned down to kiss him. The scent of it, of her, surrounded him, drowned him. Then she took him in, one fluid move that encased him in heat. Twin moans merged, eyes locked. He reached for her, his hands sliding, slippery, up her body, over her breasts. She covered them with her own, holding him to her. And then she began to move. Slow. Painfully and gloriously slow, so that each breath was a shudder. Pleasure slithered through the blood and began to pulse. He watched her as she took both of them higher, that graceful arch of body, that delicate line of throat. Her eyes closed as she lost herself. Her arms lifted until her hands were buried in her own rich mass of hair. A sound rippled in her throat of pleasure rising. She began to drive him, drive herself, her hips like lightning. It was all speed and power now. With a kind of greedy glee, they dragged each other toward the edge. Held there, held until madness had them leaping recklessly over. When she folded herself down to him, trembling still, his arms locked around her. Love me, she thought. Her heart was raw with loving him. Tell me, why won't you tell me? He shifted her so that she could curl against him, so he could hold her there. Will you stay? Kate closed her eyes. Yes. They lay quiet in each other's arms, but neither slept for a long time. He woke, reaching for her. Confusion came first as he struggled to remember where he was. He was alone, in bed, in the dark. Groggy, he glanced over at a faint sound and saw Kate, in the faint wash of light through the window, slipping into her robe. What is it? Oh, I didn't mean to wake you. Whispering, she stepped over to the side of the bed, bent down to kiss his cheek. I have to go. Dance class. Huh? You're teaching class in the middle of the night? I'm taking class, and it's not the middle of the night. It's nearly six. He tried to clear his brain, but it objected to functioning on four hours sleep. You're taking class? I thought you knew how to dance. Smart Alec. No, wait. He grabbed for her hand before she could move away. Why are you taking class? And why are you taking it at six in the morning? I'm taking class because I'm a dancer, and dancers never really stop taking class. Certainly not if they're performing. And I'm taking it at seven in the morning because I have a dress rehearsal at eleven. Now go back to sleep. Oh. Okay. Nick and Freddie are going to take you around later, wherever. Maybe you can drop by the theater. She waited for a response, then leaned down. Well, she muttered, he didn't have any trouble taking that particular order. She left him sleeping and went to prepare for a very long day. Are you sure it's okay? Brody looked dubiously at the motley crew approaching the stage door. Three adults, three kids, and a small mixed-breed puppy. Absolutely, Freddie assured him. Kate cleared it. He still wasn't convinced, but he'd already discovered it was hard to argue with either Kimball sister, especially on five hours sleep. The kids had bounded awake by the time Kate was taking her class, and they'd created enough noise to wake the entire island of Manhattan. Anyone deaf enough to sleep through it would have been jolted awake by Mike's high, ferociously joyful barking. They'd had breakfast in a deli which had delighted Jack, then had proceeded to walk their feet off. The Empire State Building, souvenir shops, Times Square, souvenir shops, Grand Central Station, God help him, souvenir shops. Brody decided horning in on Kate's rehearsal wasn't such a bad idea after all. It was in a theater, and last time he checked, a theater had chairs. Lips zipped, Nick warned, or they'll kick us out. That goes for you too, Furball, he added, scratching Mike behind the ears. Nothing like backstage. Freddy linked her hand with Nick as they entered. A woman behind a high counter glanced up over wire rim glasses, scanned, then nodded. Nice to see you, Ms. Kimball, Mr. Lebeck. See you brought the crew. Kate, clear the way, 
Freddy asked. She did. Any of these kids understand Russian? No. Good. Davidov's in rare form. You can leave the pup with me. I like dogs, and if he gets frisky out there, Davidov's liable to eat him. That kind of day, huh? Nick grinned, and the woman rolled her eyes. You don't know the half of it. What's his name? His name is Mike, Jack piped up. He's mine. I'll take real good care of him. Okay. Biting his lip, Jack passed Mike up to her. But if he cries, you have to come get me. That's a deal. Go on ahead, you know the way. If they hadn't, after a short twist through backstage, they could have followed the bellows. Davidov. Freddy gave a mock shudder. We'll just detour this way and go out front, where it's safe. Does he really eat dogs? Jack asked in a hissing whisper. No. Brody took a firm hold of his son's hand. She was just kidding. He hoped. He didn't eat dogs, but at the moment, Davidoff would have cheerfully dined on dancers. He cut off the music again with a dramatic slice of his hand through the air. You! You! He pointed at the couple currently panting and dripping sweat. Go. Off my stage. Soak your heads. Maybe you'll come back in one hour like dancers. Kimball, he shouted. Blackstone, now! He paced back and forth, a slim man in dull gray sweats and a dramatic mane of gold and silver hair. His face was carved and cold. He's scary, Jack decided. Shh! Brody hitched Jack onto his lap after they'd slipped into a row of seats behind a lone woman. Then Kate came on stage and his mouth simply dropped. It's Kate! Look, Dad, she's all dressed up. Yeah, I see. Quiet now. Her hair was loose, raining down the back of a flamboyant costume, boldly red with layers of skirt flowing out from a nipped waist. It stopped just below her knees and showed off long legs that ended in toe shoes. She sauntered, hands on hips, until she was toe-to-toe -to -toe with Davidov. You ordered me off stage. Don't do that again. I order you on, I order you off. That is what I do. What you do is dance. You... He flicked a finger at the tall, gilt-haired man in white who'd come out with Kate. Step back. Wait. Red Rose, he told the orchestra. Opening solo. Kimball, you are Carlotta, he said to Kate. Be Carlotta. Lights. Kate sucked in a breath, took her position. Left leg back, foot turned and straight as a ruler, arms lifted, curved into fluid lines, head up and defiant. When the music began, the strings, she felt the beats. The single spotlight hit her like a torch. She danced. It was a viciously demanding solo, fast, lightning fast, and wildly flamboyant. Her muscles responded, her feet flew. She ended with a snap in precisely the same spot and in the same position where she'd begun. Heart pounding from the effort, she shot Davida for defiant and unscripted look, then pirouetted off stage as her partner leaped into his cue. He'd never seen anything like it. Hadn't known there could be anything like it. She'd been... magic, Brody thought, and was still trying to process this new aspect of her when she flew back on stage. They danced together now, Kate and the man in white. He hadn't realized ballet could be... sexy. But this was, almost raw, certainly edgy, a kind of classic mating dance with arrogant male, defiant female... He didn't see the small balancing steps, the sets, the releases. Didn't see how she helped her partner lift her by springing with her knees, or how the muscles in her legs trembled with the effort to keep them extended in midair. He only saw the speed, the dazzle, the magic, and was jerked rudely out of the moment by the shout. Stop! 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 Davidov threw up his hands. What is this? What is it? Do you have hot blood? Do you have passion? Or are you strolling through the park on Sunday? Where is the fire? I'll give you fire, Kate whirled on him. Good. He grabbed her at the waist. With me, show me. He hoisted her up, even as she cursed him. She came down like a thunderbolt, hearing the music only in her head now, soaring into a series of jetés. He caught her again, spun her into a triple pirouette, then lifted her, lowering her until her head nearly brushed the stage. Sharp moves, challenges, and she was back on point, her eyes firing darts into his. There now, do again, stay angry. I hate you, not me, him. He flicked a hand and brought the music back. What the hell does he want? Brody demanded, forgetting himself. Blood? The woman in the row ahead turned, gave him a dazzling smile. Yes, exactly, he always has. A difficult man, Davidov. Daddy says he ought to be shot, Jack added helpfully. 
Your father isn't alone in thinking that. She laughed, turning farther in her seat as the dancing and the cursing continued on stage. He's harder, much harder on the dancers who are the best. I used to dance with him myself, so I know. Did he yell at you? Yes, and I yelled right back. But I was a better dancer for it, and for him. He still made me very, very angry, though. What did you do? Jack's eyes were big as saucers. Did you punch him in the nose? No. I married him. She grinned at Brody. I'm Ruth Banyan. You must be a friend of Kate's. Excuse me, I'd like to get my foot out of my mouth. No, no. She let out a low, delighted laugh. Davidoff brings out the best and the worst. That's what makes him what he is. He adores Kate and is still mourning she's left the company. Ruth glanced back toward the stage. Look at her, and you can see why. All right, all right, enough. On stage, Davidoff let out a windy sigh. Go rest. Perhaps tonight you will find me some energy. The blood was pounding in Kate's ears. Her feet were screaming. But she had enough energy right now for a short tirade. When she was done and simply panting, Davidoff lifted his eyebrow. You think because I'm Russian I don't know when a Ukrainian calls me a man with the heart of a pig? Her chin shot up. I believe I said the face of a pig. She stalked off stage and left him grinning after her. See? Ruth smiled. He adores her. Chapter 11 Kate was busy kissing the Russian when Brody came to her dressing room door after the evening performance. She was wearing a robe, short and red, and full stage makeup. Her hair was still pinned up in some sleek and sophisticated knot the way it had been during her second dance, the Spanish one in the sexy little tutu. The audience had gone wild for her, and so, Brody thought, had he. Now he'd come back to tell her only to find her wrapped around the Russian she'd cursed only that afternoon. He wondered which one of them he should kill first. Sorry to interrupt. Kate merely turned her head, eyes brilliant, and beamed at him. Brody. She held out a hand, but Davidoff merely shifted his arm around her shoulders and eyed the intruder coolly. This is the carpenter, the one who wants to shoot me. Now I think he wants to shoot me more. He doesn't like that I kiss you. Oh, don't be silly. Brody cut his eyes back to hers. I don't like that he kisses you. That's absurd. This is Davidoff. I know who it is. Brody shut the door behind him. He preferred spilling blood in relative privacy. I met your wife today. Yes, she likes you and your little boy. I have a son and two daughters. Because he rarely resisted impulses, and it was delightful to watch the man's fury heat, Davidoff kissed Kate's hair. She knows, my wife, that I've come back to kiss this one. Who was? He continued, drawing back, his hand sliding down her arms to link with hers. Magnificent. Who was perfect. Who I don't forgive for leaving me. I felt magnificent. I felt perfect. Still so perfect, none of the aches could push through. And I'm happy. Happy. He rolled his eyes to the ceiling. As your director, what do I care if you're happy as long as you dance? As your friend, he heaved a sigh and kissed her hands. I'm glad you have what you want. We'll all end up a lot happier if you step back, Brody commented. Kate frowned. Jealousy isn't attractive, and in this case certainly misplaced. Murder isn't attractive, but it really seems to fit. One minute, Davidoff said dismissively to both of them. You want to snarl at each other, wait until I finish. I wrote the red rose for my Ruth, he said to Kate, my heart. There's no one but you who has been Carlotta as she was Carlotta. Oh. Tears swirled into her eyes, spilled out. Damn it, you are missed. So I insist you be very, very happy or I will come to your West Virginia and drag you back. Now he cupped her face, spoke quietly in Russian. You want this man? She nodded. Da. Well, then. He pressed his lips to her forehead, then turned to study Brody. Me? I'm a man who loves his wife. You met her, so you should see that she is all I treasure. I kiss this one because she is also a treasure. If you had eyes in your head to watch her tonight, this you should also know. His eyes gleamed now in amused challenge. Still, if I find another man kissing what's mine, I break his legs. But I'm Russian. I usually start with the arms. I'm Irish. Davidoff's laugh was rich, and his face went brilliant. I like him. Good. Satisfied, he slapped Brody on the shoulder on his way out the door. Isn't he wonderful? A few hours ago you hated him. Oh. She waved a hand and sat down to cream off her makeup. 
That was rehearsal. I always hate him during rehearsals. Do you always kiss him after a performance? If it goes particularly well, he's a bully, a genius. He's Davidev, she said simply. I wouldn't be the dancer I am, maybe not even the woman I am, without having worked with him. We're intimate, Brody, but not sexually, not ever. He adores his wife. All right? You're saying it's an art thing. In a nutshell, not that removed from ball players hugging each other and patting each other's butts after a really good game. I don't remember ever seeing your brother kiss his shortstop after a double play, but okay, I get it. Good. It went beautifully, didn't it? She spun around on her stool. Did you like it? You were incredible. I've never seen anything like it. Never seen anything like you. Oh, she leaped off the stool, threw her arms around him. I'm so glad. Oh, she laughed and rubbed at the smear she'd transferred to his cheek. Sorry, I wanted it to be incredible. I got so nervous when I realized the family was here. Mama and Dad sneaking up from home and Grandma and Grandpa, all the aunts and uncles and cousins, and Brandon sent flowers. She grabbed more tissue, sniffling as she sat again. I thought I might be sick, my stomach was churning, so she pressed a hand to it now. But then all I felt was the music. When that happens, you know, you just know. He glanced around the room. It was crowded with flowers, literally hundreds of roses, bottles of champagne, her exotic costumes. All of those glamorous things filled it and were pale next to her excitement. How could she leave all this? He wondered, why should she? He started to ask, then her door burst open. Her family poured in, and the moment was lost. She seemed to be just as much in her element the next day in the house in Brooklyn where her grandparents lived. The exotic siren who'd flamed across the stage the night before had been replaced by a lovely woman comfortable in jeans and bare feet. It was a puzzle, Brody decided, trying to fit the two of them together into a hole. He intended to take the time to do so. But for now, the best he could do was experience. The house was crammed with people. So many of them, he wondered if there was enough oxygen to go around. The noise level was a wonder. A piano stood against one wall and was played by various fingers at various times. Everything from rock to Bach. The sense of cooking wafted through the air. Wine was poured with generous hands and nobody seemed to stay still for more than five minutes. His son was wallowing in it. He could see him, if he angled his head through other bodies, sprawled on the worn rug with Max, bashing cars together. The last time he'd been able to spot Jack, he'd been sitting on Yuri's lap, having what appeared to have been a serious conversation that had involved a number of gumdrops. And before that, he'd raced down the stairs in the wake of a couple of young teenagers. Since Brody hadn't seen him go up the stairs in the first place, he was trying to keep a closer eye on his son. He's fine. A woman with the trademark Stanislavski looks, wild, bold, beautiful, dropped onto the couch beside him. Rachel, she said with a quick grin, Kate's aunt. Hard to keep us straight, isn't it? There are a lot of you. Rachel, he thought, trying desperately to remember the details. Kate's mother's sister, a judge, that's right, married to the guy who owned the bar, and the guy who owned the bar was Nick's half-brother. Was it any wonder a man couldn't keep them lined up? You'll get the hang of it. That's my guy there. She gestured toward a tall man who had his arm hooked around the throat of a gangly boy with dark hair. Currently choking our son Gideon while he talks to Sydney, the exceptional redhead who's married to my brother Mick, and Laurel, Mick and Sydney's youngest. Mick's over there arguing with my other brother Alex, while Alex's wife Bess, the other exceptional redhead, appears to be discussing something of great importance with her daughter Carmen, and Nick and Freddie's Kelsey. The tall, handsome young man just coming out of the kitchen is Mick's oldest, Griff, who seems to have charmed some food out of my mother, Nadia. Got that? Uh. You absorb that a while. She laughed and patted his knee, because there are so many more of us. Meanwhile, your son's fine, and you don't have a drink. Wine? Sure, why not? No, I'll get it. She patted him again and dashed off. Almost immediately, Griff plopped down and began to talk carpentry. That, at least, Brody had a handle on. Kate wound her way through the bodies, sat on the arm of the couch, and offered him one of two glasses of wine. Okay over here? Yeah, fine. I figure it's kind of like the Boy Scout rule. When you're lost, sit down in one spot and they'll find you. People drop down here, talk for a couple minutes, then move off. I'm starting to be able to keep them straight working it that way. Even as he spoke, Alex settled on the couch, propped his feet on the coffee table. 
So, Bess and I are thinking about adding a couple of rooms onto our weekend place. See, Brody said to Kate, then shifted. What did you have in mind? Kate left him to it and wandered into the kitchen. Her mother was at the table, putting the finishing touches on an enormous salad. Nadia was at the stove, supervising as Mick's youngest son, Adam, stirred something in a pot. Need some more hands? Always too many hands in my kitchen, Nadia said. Her hair was snow white now, a soft wave around a strong face lined with years. But her eyes danced with amusement as she patted Adam. There, you have done well. Go. But we're going to eat soon, right? We're starving. Very soon. Tell your brothers and sisters, your cousins, my table must be set. All right. He shot out of the room, shouting orders. He wants to be in charge, that one. Natasha laughed. Mama, they all want to be in charge. How's Brody holding up, Katie? He's talking with Uncle Alex. Kate snitched a crouton, then wandered to the stove to sniff at pots. Isn't he adorable? He has good eyes, Nadia said. Strong, kind, and he raises his son well. You show good taste. I learned from the best. She leaned over to kiss Nadia's cheek. Thank you for welcoming him. Nadia felt her heart sigh. Go, help set the table. Your young man and his little boy will think no one eats in this house. They'll soon find out differently. She snatched another crouton and kissed the top of her mother's head on the way out. Well, Nadia stared hard into a pot. We'll be dancing at her wedding. You're pleased with him? Of course. Natasha could barely see as she prepared to dress the salad. He's a good man. He makes her happy. And to be honest, I think if I could have chosen for her myself, it would have been Brody. Oh, Mama. Eyes drenched, Natasha looked over at the stove. She's my baby. I know. I know. Nadia hurried over for the hug, then offered Natasha one corner of her apron while she used the other to dry her eyes. By midweek, Kate was hard at work and anxious to open her doors for the first students. The studio itself was complete. The floors were smooth and gleaming, the walls glistening with mirrors. Her office was organized, the dressing areas outfitted. And now the front window was finished. Kimball School of Dance. She stood out on the sidewalk, her palms together and pressed to her lips, reading it over and over again. Dreams, she thought, came true. All you had to do was believe hard enough and work long enough. Oh, miss? Hmm? Lost in her own joy, she turned, then blinked at the woman crossing the street. The woman, Kate remembered with a sinking stomach, who'd seen Brody cart her outside over his shoulder. Oh, yes. Hello. Hello. We didn't really meet before. The woman looked as uneasy as Kate and fiddled with the strap of her shoulder bag. I'm Marjorie Rowan. Kate Kimball. Yes, I know. Actually, I sort of know your boyfriend, too. The landlord's hired him a couple of times to see to things in my building. Ah, Kate said. Hmm. Anyway, I picked up one of your brochures the other day from your mother's store. My little girl, she's eight. She's just been nagging me half to death about taking ballet classes. Relief came first. It was not to be a conversation about creating public scenes on quiet streets. Then came the pleasure at the possibility of another student. I'd be happy to talk to you about it, and to her if you'd like. First classes start next week. Would you like to come in, see the school? Truth is, we've peeked in the window a few times. I hope you don't mind. Of course not. I've been telling Audrey, that's my girl, that I'd think about it. I guess I have. I'd like her to be able to try it. Why don't you come inside and tell me about Audrey? Thanks. She'll be home from school soon. This'll be a nice surprise. She started up the stairs, relaxing now. You know, I always wanted ballet lessons when I was a girl. We couldn't swing it. Why don't you take them now? Now? Marjorie laughed and stepped inside. Oh, I'm too old for ballet lessons. They're wonderful exercise. It increases flexibility, and they're fun. No one's too old for that. You look to be in very good shape. I do what I can. Marjorie looked around, smiling a little dreamily at the bars, the mirrors, the framed posters. I guess it would be fun. But I couldn't afford classes for both of us. We'll talk about that, too. Come on back to my office. An hour later, Kate rushed upstairs. She wanted to share with someone, and Brody was elected. She had two new students, her first mother and daughter team, and the accomplishment had given her yet one more angle for her school. Family plans. She started to dash across the little living room and stopped in her tracks. Slowly, she turned a circle. It was done. She hadn't been paying enough attention, she decided, and the progress had zipped right by her. 
The floors and walls were finished. The woodwork glowed like silk. Dazzled, she walked into her kitchen where everything gleamed. Cabinets waited only to be filled. The windowsill cried out for flower pots. She ran a fingertip along the countertop. Brody had been right about the breakfast bar, she thought. He had been right. No, they had been right, she corrected, about everything. The apartment, just like the rest of the building, had been a team effort, and it was perfect. She hurried into the bedroom where Brody was kneeling on the floor installing the lock sets on her closet doors. Jack sat cross-legged, tongue caught in his teeth as he carefully tightened a screw in a brass plate on a wall plug. Mike snored contentedly between them. There's nothing quite like watching men at work. They glanced up and made her heart sing. Hello, handsome Jack. We're punching out, he told her. I got to come help because Rod and Carrie had to go to the dentist. I went already, and no cavities. Good for you. Brody, I've been so involved downstairs that I haven't taken in what you've done up here. It looks wonderful. It's exactly right. Still got a few details. Some outside work, too. But you're pretty much good to go. But he didn't have that lift of satisfaction he usually experienced toward the end of a job. He'd been depressed for days. I love it. She crouched down as Mike woke and gambled over to greet her. And I just signed two more students. Now if I could just find a couple of handsome men who'd like to go out and celebrate, it would really round things off. We'll go, Jack, it's a school night. I was thinking about an early dinner, Kate improvised as Jack's face fell. Burgers and fries at Shea McDee. She means McDonald's, Jack explained, then fell on his father's back, hugging fiercely. Please, can we? Cornered again, Brody thought. Pretty tough for a guy to turn down a fancy meal like that. He means yes. Jack swung over to Kate and hugged her legs. Can we go now? I got some things to finish up here. Brody pushed his hair back and just looked at her. He'd been doing that quite a bit, Kate thought, since they'd come back from New York, looking at her and looking at her differently somehow. Differently enough to have frogs leaping in her belly again. An hour okay with you? He asked. Perfect. Do you mind if I steal your helper here? I want to go tell my mother. We can give Mike a little exercise on the way. Yeah, sure. Jack? No wheedling. He means I can't ask for toys. I'll get Mike's leash. Dad, can I... He broke off, then ran over to whisper in Brody's ear. Yeah, go ahead. We'll be back in an hour. Great. Brody waited until they'd chased Mike downstairs, then sat back on his heels. He was going to have to make some decisions, and soon. It was bad enough he was stuck on Kate, but Jack was crazy about her. A man could risk a few bumps and bruises on his own heart, but he couldn't risk his child's. The only thing to do was to sit down and have a talk with Kate. It was time they spelled out what was going on between them. More, he was going to have to have a talk with Jack. He had to know what the boy was thinking, what he was feeling. Jack first, Brody decided. Could be, could very well be, his son looked at Kate as nothing more than a friend and would be upset at the idea of her being a more permanent, more important part of their lives. It had been the two of them as long as Jack could remember. He looked over with a little jolt as a movement caught the corner of his eye. You turn that noise down, Bob O'Connell said. You wouldn't get taken by surprise. I like the music on the job. But Brody Rose shut off the radio. Something you need? They hadn't spoken since the scene in the Kimball kitchen. Both men eyed each other warily. I got something to say, Bob stated. Then say it. I did my best by you. It ain't right for you to say different when I did my best by you. Maybe I was hard on you, but you had a wild streak and you needed hard. I had a family to support and I did it the only way I knew how. Maybe you think I didn't spend enough time with you. Bob broke off, jammed his hands into his pockets. Maybe I didn't. I don't have the knack for it, not the way you do with your boy. Fact is, you weren't the same pleasure to be around Jack is. He's a credit to you. Maybe I should have said so before, but I'm saying so now. Brody said nothing for a long moment, adjusting to the shock even as his father glared at him. You know, I'm pretty sure that's about the longest speech you ever aimed in my direction. Bob's face hardened. I'm done with it, he said and turned. Dad. Brody set his drill aside. I appreciate it. Bob let out a breath, the way a man might as the trap door opened under his feet. Well... He turned back, fought with the words in his head. Might as well finish it off, then. Probably I shouldn't have jumped on you the other day, not in front of your boy and your... 
the Kimball girl. Your mother lit into me over it. Brody could only stare. Mom? Yeah. With a look of frustrated disgust, Bob kicked lightly at the door jam. She don't do it often, but when she does, she can peel the skin off your ass, hardly speaking to me yet, says I embarrassed her. I got the same line from Kate. She did some peeling of her own. Didn't much care having her claw at me the way she did. But I gotta say she's got spine. Keep you straight. It's my job to keep myself straight. Bob nodded. The weight that had been pressing on his chest for days eased. Guess I figure you've been doing your job there. You do good work. For a carpenter. For the first time in a long while, Brody was able to smile at his father and mean it. You do good work. For a plumber. Didn't have any problem firing me. You pissed me off. Hell, boy, you fire every man who pisses you off. How are you going to put a crew together? How's the hand? Brody lifted it, flexed his fingers. Good enough. Since you've got no permanent damage, maybe you can use that hand to dial the phone. Call your ma and let her know we cleared the air some. She might not take my word on it, given her current state of mind. I'll do that. I know I was a disappointment to you. Now hold on, I was, Brody continued. Maybe I was a disappointment to myself, too. But I think I made up for it. I did it for Connie and for Jack. For myself, too. And I did it, partly anyway, for you. So I could show you I was worth something. You showed me. Bob wasn't good at taking first steps, but he took this one. He crossed the room, held out his hand. I guess I'm proud of how you turned out. Thanks. He took his father's hand in a firm grip. I have a kitchen remodel coming up. Need some plumbing work. Interested? Bob's lips twitched. Could be. Chapter 12 While father and son were closing a gap, Kate strolled with the third generation of O'Connell male. I didn't wheedle, right? Wheedle? She sent him a shocked stare. Why, handsome Jack, Mama and I had to practically force that plane on you. We had to beg you to accept it. Jack grinned up at her. You'll tell Dad? Of course. He's going to want to play with it, you know. It's a very cool plane. Jack swirled it through the air. It's like the one I got to fly on all the way to New York and back again. It was fun. I told everybody thanks in the cards I sent. Did you like your card? I did it almost all by myself. I loved my card. Kate patted her pocket where the thank you note, painstakingly printed, resided. It was very polite and gentlemanly of you to write one to me, and to Freddie and Nick and to my grandparents. They said I could come back. Papa Yuri said I could sometimes spend the night at his house. You'd like that? Yeah, he can wiggle his ears. I know. Kate? Hmm? She bent to untangle Mike from his leash, then glanced up to see Jack studying her. So serious, she thought, so intent, just like his father. What is it, handsome Jack? Can we... Can we sit on the wall so we can talk about stuff? Sure. Very serious, Kate realized as she boosted him up on the wall in front of the college. She passed Mike up to him, then hopped up beside them. What kind of stuff? I was wondering... He trailed off again while Mike scrambled off to sniff at the grass behind them. He'd talked it all over with his best friends, Max in New York and then Rod at school. It was a secret. They'd spit on their palms to seal it. You like my dad, don't you? Of course I do. I like him very much. And you like kids. Like me? I like kids. I especially like you. She draped an arm around him, rubbed his shoulder. We're friends. Dad and I like you, too, a whole lot. So I was wondering... He looked up at her, his eyes so young, so earnest. Will you marry us? Oh. Her heart stumbled, then fell with a splat. Oh, Jack... If you did, you could come live in our house. Dad's fixing it up good, and we have a yard and everything, and we're going to plant a garden soon. In the mornings, you could have breakfast with us, then drive to your school and teach people how to dance. Then you could drive home. It's not real far. Staggered, she laid her cheek on top of his head. Oh, boy. Dad's really nice, Jack rushed on. He hardly ever yells. He doesn't have a wife anymore because she had to go to heaven. I wish she didn't, but she did. I know. Oh, baby. Maybe Dad's afraid to ask you in case you go to heaven, too. That's what Rod thinks. Maybe. But you won't, will you? Jack. She fought back tears and cupped his face. 
I plan to stay here for a very long time. Have you talked to your father about this? Nuh-uh, because you're supposed to ask the girl. That's what Max said. The boy has to ask the girl. Me and Dad will buy you a ring, because girls need to have one. I won't mind if you kiss me, and I'll be really good. You and Dad can make babies like people do when they get married. I'd rather have a brother, but if it's a sister, that's okay. We'll love each other and everything. So will you please marry us? In all her dreams and fantasies, she'd never imagined being proposed to by a six-year-old boy while sitting on a wall on an afternoon in early spring. Nothing could have been more touching, she thought, more lovely. Jack, I'm going to tell you a secret. I already love you. You do? Yes, I do. I already love your dad, too. I'm going to think really hard about everything you said, really hard. That way, if I say yes, you're going to know, absolutely, that it's what I want more than anything else in the whole world. If I say yes, you wouldn't just be your dad's little boy anymore. You'd be mine, too. Do you understand that? He nodded, all eyes. You'd be my mom, right? Yes, I'd be your mom. Okay, would you? I'm going to think about it. She pressed her lips to his forehead, then hopped down. Will it take a long time to think? She reached up for him. Not this time. She held him close before she set him on his feet. But let's keep this a secret a little while longer while I do. She gave it almost 24 hours. After all, she was a woman who knew her own mind. Maybe the timing wasn't quite perfect, but it couldn't be helped. Certainly the way things were tumbling weren't in the nice, neat, logical row she'd have preferred. But she could be flexible. When she wanted something badly enough, she could be very flexible. She considered asking Brody out for a romantic dinner for two. Rejected it. A proposal in a public restaurant would make it too difficult to pin him down, should it become necessary. She toyed with the idea of waiting for the weekend, planning that romantic dinner for two at Brody's house. Candlelight, wine, seductive music. That was her next rejection. If Jack hadn't spilled the beans by then, she very likely would herself. It wouldn't be exactly the way she'd pictured it. There wouldn't be moonlight and music, with Brody looking deep into her eyes as he told her he loved her, asked her to spend her life loving him. Maybe it wouldn't be perfect, but it would be right. Atmosphere didn't matter at this point, she told herself. Results did. So why wait? She started upstairs. It was good timing after all, she realized. He was just finishing the job that had brought them together. Why not propose marriage in the space they had, in a very real way, made together? It was perfect. Convinced of it, Kate was very displeased to find the rooms over the school empty. Well, where the hell did you go? She fisted her hands on her hips and paced. School bus, she remembered, spinning for the door. It was one of his days to pick up Jack. She glanced at her watch as she sprinted down the stairs. He couldn't have been gone more than a few minutes. Hey, where's the fire? Spence caught her as she leaped down the last steps. Dad, sorry, gotta run, I need to catch Brody. Something wrong? No, no. She gave him a quick kiss on the cheek and wiggled free. I need to ask him to marry me. Oh, well, whoa. She was younger, faster, but parental shock shot him to the door in time to snag her. What did you say? I'm going to ask Brody to marry me. I've got it all worked out. Katie, I love him. I love Jack. Dad, I don't have time to explain it all, but I've thought it through. Trust me. Just catch your breath and let me... But he looked at her face, into her eyes. Stars, he thought. His little girl had stars in her eyes. He hasn't got a prayer. Thanks. She threw her arms around her father's neck. Wish me luck anyway. Good luck. He let her go, then watched her run. Bye, baby. He murmured.
Brody made a stop for milk, bread, and eggs. Jack had developed an obsession with French toast. As he turned into his lane, he checked his watch. A good ten minutes before the bus, he noted. He'd mistimed it a bit. Resigned to the wait, he climbed out, let Mike race up the hill and back. Spring was coming on fine, he thought, greening the leaves, teasing the early flowers into tight buds. It brought something into the air, he mused. Maybe it was hope. The house, the ramble of it, was looking like a home. Soon he'd stick a hammock in the yard, maybe a rocker on the porch, maybe a porch swing. He'd get Jack a little splash pool. Jack and Mike could play in the yard, roll around on the grass on those long, hot summer evenings. He'd sit on the porch swing and watch, sit on the swing with Kate. Funny, he couldn't put a real picture into his head anymore unless Kate was in it, and didn't want to. He'd have to take his time, Brody mused, get a sense of where Jack stood in all of it. After that, it would be a matter of seeing if Kate was willing to take everything to the next level. Maybe it was time to give her a little nudge in that direction. Nothing was ever perfect, was it? Everything in life was a work in progress. It was like building a house. He figured they had a good, solid foundation. He had the design in his head. Him, Kate, Jack, and the kids who came along after. A house needed kids. So it was time to start putting up the frame, making it solid. Maybe she wouldn't be ready for marriage yet, with her school just getting off the ground. She might need some time to adjust to the idea of being a mother to a six-year-old. He could give her some time. He stood, looking over his land, studying the house on the hill that just seemed to be waiting. Not a lot of time, he decided. Once he started building, he liked to keep right on building. And he wanted Kate working on this, the most important project of his life, with him. The first thing to do, he decided, as he walked to the mailbox, was to talk to Jack about it. His son had to feel secure, comfortable, and happy. Jack was crazy about Kate. Maybe Jack would be a little worried about the changes marrying her would bring, but Brody could reassure his son. They'd talk about it tonight, he decided, after dinner. He just couldn't wait any longer than that to start things moving. When he and Jack were square, he'd figure out what to say to Kate, what to do to move everybody along to the next stage of the floor plan. He got the mail out of the box and was sifting through it on the way back to the truck when Kate pulled in beside him. Hey! Surprised, he tossed the mail into the cab of his truck. Didn't expect to see you out this way today. After she got out of the car, she picked up the mangled hunk of rope Mike spit at her feet, engaged him in a brief bout of tug-of-war, then threw it. She had a damn good arm, far enough to keep him busy a while. Watching her playing with the dog, all Brody could think about was that he couldn't wait very long. I just missed you at the school, she told him. Problem there? No, not at all. No problem anywhere. She walked to him and slid her hands up his chest, a habit that never failed to pump up his heart rate. You didn't kiss me goodbye. Your office door was closed. I figured you were busy. Kiss me goodbye now. She brushed her lips over his, arched a brow when he kept it light and started to ease back. Do better. Kate, the bus is going to come along in a couple minutes. Do better, she murmured, and melting against him shifted the mood. He fisted a hand in the back of her shirt, another in her hair, and indulged both of them. Hmm, that's more like it. It's spring, she added, tipping back so that she could see his face. Do you know what a young man's fancy turns to in spring? Besides baseball. He grinned at her. Plowing? She laughed, linking her fingers behind his neck. Yeah, the frogs were still jumping, but she liked it. All right, do you know what a young woman's fancy turns to? What this young woman's fancy turns to? Is that what you came out here to tell me? Yes, more or less. Brody, she nibbled her bottom lip, then just blurted it out. I want you to marry me. He jerked, froze. There was a buzzing in his ears, a hive of wild bees. He had to be hearing things, he decided. Had to. She couldn't have just asked him to marry her when he'd spent the last five minutes trying to figure out how and when to ask her. To get his bearings, he retreated a step. It's not very flattering for you to gape at me as though I'd just hit you over the head with a two-by-four. Where did this come from? Maybe he was just dreaming. But she looked real, she'd tasted real, and the thundering of his own heart wasn't the least bit dreamlike. Besides, in his dreams, he asked her. Damn it. A woman doesn't just walk up to a man in the middle of the day and ask him to marry her. Why not? Because... How was he supposed to think of reasons with all those bees in his head? Because she doesn't. Well, I just did. 
She felt her temper sizzle into her throat and managed to swallow it. Her fingers shook slightly as she lifted them to begin ticking off points. We've been seeing each other exclusively for months. We're not children. We enjoy each other. We respect each other. It's a natural and perfectly logical progression to consider marriage. He needed to take control back, he realized, right here, right now. You didn't say let's consider marriage, did you? You didn't say let's discuss it. Which had been his plan if she'd given him the chance. There are a lot of factors here besides two people who enjoy and respect each other. And love each other, he thought. God, he loved her. But he needed to know what they wanted for the future, separately, together, as a family. There were things they were just going to have to set straight once and for all. Of course there are, she began. But let's start with you. Right now you're free to pick up your dance career anytime you want. There's nothing stopping you from going back to New York, back on stage. My school is stopping me. I made that decision before I met you. Kate, I saw you. I watched you up there and you were a miracle. Teaching's never going to give you what that gave you. No, it's not. It's going to give me something else. The something else I want now. I'm not a person who makes decisions lightly, Brody. When I left the company to come back here, I knew what I was doing what I was leaving behind, what I was moving toward. If you don't trust me to make a commitment, then stand by it. You don't know me. It's not a matter of trust, but I wanted to hear you say it, to me, just like that. You say you mean to stay, you mean to stay. I've never known anybody as focused on a goal as you. He'd thought moments before he'd known how he would handle this, the steps he'd take toward asking her to share his life, building on that foundation. Now the woman had finished nailing on the trim and wanted a wreath for the door. She was going to have to back up a few steps because he built to last. I've got something more than a career decision to consider. I've got Jack. Everything I do or don't do involves Jack. Brody, I'm perfectly aware of that. You know I am. I know he likes you, but he's secure the way things are, and he needs to be sure of me. Kate. God, he's only ever had me. Connie, she got sick when he was only a few months old between doctors and the treatments and the hospitals. Oh, Brody. She could imagine it too well, the panic, the upheaval, the grief. She couldn't really be there for him, and I was just trying to hold it all together. The world was falling apart on us, and I had nothing extra to give Jack. The first two years of his life were a nightmare. And you've done everything you can to give him a happy and normal life. Don't you see how much I admire that, how much I respect it? Flustered, he stared at her. He'd never thought of parenting as admirable. It's what I'm supposed to do. Thinking of him first, that's how it has to be. It's not just you and me, Kate. If it were... But it's not. A change like this. A life-altering one. He has to be in on it. And who's saying differently? She demanded. Well, damn it. I can't just go tell him I'm getting married just like that. I need to talk to him about it. Prepare him. So do you. That's the kind of thing you'd be taking on. He needs to be as sure of you as he is of me. For heaven's sake, O'Connell, don't you think I've taken all of that into account... You've known me for months now. You ought to be able to give me more credit. It's not a matter of... It was Jack who asked me to marry you in the first place. Brody stared into her flushed and furious face, then held up his hands. I have to sit down. He backed up, dropped down on a flattened stump. Because the dog was shoving the rope into his lap, Brody tossed it. What did you just say? Am I speaking English? She demanded. Jack proposed to me yesterday... Apparently, he doesn't have as much trouble making up his mind as his father. He asked me to marry you, both of you, and I've never had a lovelier offer. Obviously, I'm not going to get one from you. You would have if you'd waited a couple of days. He muttered under his breath. So are you doing this to make Jack happy? Listen up. However much I love that child, I wouldn't marry his boneheaded father unless I wanted to. He happens to think we'd all be good for each other. I happen to agree with him. But you can just sit there like a like a bump on that log. Not only had Kate beat him to the punch, Brody thought, his six-year-old son had crossed the finish line ahead of him. He wasn't sure if he was annoyed or delighted. Maybe I wouldn't be if you hadn't snuck up on me with this. Snuck up on you? How could you not see? I've done everything but paint a heart on my sleeve. Why haven't I moved my things out of storage and into that apartment, Brody? An organized, practical woman like me doesn't ignore something like that unless she has no intention of ever living there. He got to his feet. I figured you just wanted... I don't know. Why have I squeezed every minute I could manage out of the last few months to spend with you or with you and Jack? Why would I come here like this, toss away my pride and ask you to marry me? Why would I do any of those things unless I loved you? You idiot! 
She whipped around and stomped off toward her car while tears of hurt and fury sparkled in her eyes. There was a fist squeezing his heart, brutally. Kate, if you get in that car, I'm just going to have to drag you out again. We're not finished. She stopped with her hand on the door. I'm too angry to talk to you now. You won't have to do that much talking. Sit, he said, and gestured to the stump. I don't want to sit, Kate. She threw up her hands, stalked over and sat. There, happy? First, I don't intend to marry anyone just to give Jack a mother. And I don't intend to marry anyone who can't be a mother to him. Now let's put that aside and deal with you and me. I know you're mad, but don't cry. I wouldn't waste a single tear over you. He pulled out his bandana and dropped it in her lap. Get rid of them, okay? I'm having a hard enough time. She left his bandana where it was and dashed tears away with her fingers. Okay, this is a box. He pointed at the ground. Everything we've just said is going into this box, and I'm closing the lid. We can open it later on, but we start fresh right here and right now. As far as I'm concerned, you can nail the lid on it and throw the entire thing into a pit. I was going to talk to Jack tonight. He began, see how he felt about some changes. I figured he'd have liked the idea. I know my kid pretty well. Not as well as I assumed, since he's going around proposing to my woman behind my back. Your woman? Quiet, he said mildly. If you'd been quiet a little while longer, we'd have started out this particular area of discussion more like this. He moved closer, took her lifted chin in his hand. Kate, I'm in love with you. No, you just sit there, he told her as she started to rise. I was trying to work out how I'd do this right before you drove up. Before I... She let out a long breath. Oh. As her heart began to thud, she shifted her gaze to the ground. Is the lid on that box really tight? Yeah, it's really tight. Okay. She had to close her eyes a moment, try to clear her head, but the thrill racing through her refused to let her think straight. And that, she decided, was perfect. Just perfect. Would you mind starting again? She asked him, with the I love you part. Sure. I love you. I started sliding the first minute I saw you. Kept thinking I'd get my balance back, that you couldn't be for me. Every once in a while I'd start sliding fast, I had to pull myself back. I had lots of reasons to. I can't think of a single one of them right now, but I had them. I was for you, Brody, just like you were for me. That night in your sister's house, I couldn't pull myself back anymore. I just dropped off the edge in love with you. I'm still staggering the next day when I see you dance. Not like I saw you that day in your school where it was pretty and like a dream, but strong and powerful. That messed me up some again. He crouched down in front of her. Kate, a few minutes ago I was standing here putting a picture in my mind. I do that sometimes. You and me sitting on a port swing I still have to buy. Tears wanted to come again, but she held them back. I like that picture. Me too. See, I was figuring we were building a house, not the kind up the hill there, a kind of relationship house. I take my time building things because it's important to build them right, to build them to last. And I rushed you. Yeah, you rushed me. Something else I figured out. Two people don't always have to move at the same pace for them to end up at the same place. The right place. A tear escaped. This is the right place for me. She framed his face with her hands. I love you, Brody. I want... No, you don't. I'm making the moves here. He drew her to her feet. See that house up there on the hill? Yes. Needs work, but it's got potential. That dog chasing his tail in the yard's just about housebroken. I've got a son who's coming home from school on a bus that's running late. He's a good boy. I want to share all of that with you. And I want to come to your school sometimes just to watch you dance. I want to make babies with you. I think I'm good with them. Oh, Brody, quiet. I'm not finished. Come summer, I want to sit out in the garden while plant together. You're the only one I want to have all that with. Oh, God, just ask me before I fall apart and can't even answer you. You're pushy. I like that about you. Marry me, Kate. He touched his lips to hers. Marry me. She couldn't answer, could only lock her arms around him. Her heart poured into the kiss and gave him more than words. The dog began to yip and race in desperate circles around them. Clinging to Brody, Kate began to laugh. I'm so happy. I still wouldn't mind hearing you say yes. She tipped her head back, started to speak, and the rude blast of the school bus's air brakes drowned out her words. She turned, sliding her arm around Brody's waist, and watched Jack burst out the door. The pup took a running leap into Jack's arms. Let me, Kate murmured. Please? Hey, handsome. 
Hi. He looked at the tears on her cheeks and sent a worried look at his father. Did you get hurt? No, I didn't. Sometimes people cry when they're so happy everything bursts inside them. That's what I am right now. Remember what you asked me yesterday, Jack? He bit his lip, glanced warily at his father again. Uh-huh. Well, here's the answer for both of you. With one hand still caught in Brody's, she touched Jack's cheek. Yes. His eyes went huge. Really? Really. Dad, guess what? What? Kate's going to marry us. That's okay, right? That's absolutely okay. Let's go home. They left the truck and car parked where they were and started walking toward the house together. Jack raced ahead, the dog at his heels. At the edge of the lawn, Brody stopped, turned, kissed her. No, it wasn't okay, Kate thought. It was perfect. Epilogue. Dad, how much longer? Just a few minutes. Here, let me fix this thing. He hauled Jack up on a chair and straightened his fancy black tie, fiddled with the red rosebud on his lapel. My hands are sweaty, Brody said with a little laugh. Do you got cold feet? Grandpa said how sometimes guys get cold feet on their wedding day. No, I don't have cold feet. I love Kate. I want to marry her. Me too. You get to be the groom and I get to be the best man. That's it. He stepped back, surveyed his son. A six-year-old in a tux, he thought. You sure look slick, Jax. We look handsome. Grandma said so. And she cried. Girls cry at weddings. That's what Max said. How come? I don't know. Afterward, we'll find a girl and you can ask her. He turned Jack so they could look in the mirror together. It's a big day. Today, the three of us become a family. I get a mom and more grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins and everything. After you kiss the bride, we get to go have a party and lots of cake. Nana said so. Kate's mother had said he could call her Nana. Jack liked saying it. That's right. Then you go on your honeymoon so you can do lots more kissing. That's the plan. We're going to call Jack and send you postcards, he added, trying not to fret about going away without his boy. Uh-huh, and when you come back, we'll all live together. Rod said you and Kate are going to make a baby on your honeymoon, are you? Oh, boy. Kate and I will have to talk about that. I can call her mom now, can I? Brody shifted his gaze back to Jack's in the mirror. Yeah. She loves you, Jack. I know. Jack rolled his eyes. That's why she's marrying us. Brandon opened the door to see the groom and his best man grinning at each other. You guys ready? Yeah. Come on, Dad. Come on, let's get married. Kate stepped out of the bride's room, held out a hand to her father. You're so beautiful. He lifted her hand to his lips. My baby. Don't make me cry again. I've just put myself back together from Mom. She brushed fussily at his lapel. I'm so happy, Daddy. But I am not going to walk down the aisle with wet cheeks and red eyes. Frogs in your stomach? I think they're doing the polka. I love you. I love you, Katie. Okay. We're okay. She heard the music, nodded. That's our cue. She waited, her arm tucked in her father's, while her sister and her cousins, who were her attendants, walked down the aisle, while her little niece sprinkled rose petals on the long white runner. Then she stepped into the doorway in the billowing white dress and sparkling veil. All the nerves faded into sheer joy. Look at them, Daddy. Aren't they wonderful? She walked to them, feeling the music, and when her father put her hand in Brody's, it was steady and sure. Kate. As her father had, Brody lifted her hand to his lips. I'll make her happy, he said to Spence, then looked into Kate's eyes. You make me happy. You look pretty. Forgetting himself, Jack bounced in his new shoes. His voice carried through the church. You look really pretty, Mom. Her heart, already full, overflowed. She bent to him, kissed his cheek. I love you, Jack. You're mine now, she told him, then straightened, met Brody's eyes. And so are you. She passed her bouquet to her sister, took Jack's hand in her free one, and married them both. <laughs>